everything you needed and wanted to know about organizational change management in digital transformation. That's what we're going to cover today in episode number 124 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to a very special episode of Transformation Ground Control. This is episode number 124, and this is the change management episode. This is the podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy aspects of transformation. And of course, one of those topics that we constantly cover throughout this podcast, which is produced weekly, uh, we cover change management quite often. And that is exactly what we're going to dive into today. We're going to provide you with the best interviews so far related to change management. So what, what we've done is we've gone back and curated what we think are the highlights, the best segments that we've had on this podcast over the last two and a half years, the best guests, the best descriptions and definitions of what change management is. And we've picked out about a dozen different discussions here that are going to be uh, important to you as you continue on your transformation journey. Today, we're going to cover everything related to change management, including the basics of change management, what exactly change management is. We're going to talk about overcoming resistance. We're going to talk about creating a culture of innovation. Um, we'll have some consultants on the show. We'll have clients on the show. We'll have some case studies of, of specific clients that we've worked with over the years. Uh, as it relates to change management, we're going to talk, talk about uh, emotional intelligence, artificial intelligence versus human intelligence, the future of change management, all kinds of stuff, everything you've ever wanted to know about change management, we're going to cover here today. And I thought this would be a great episode to do, partially because we again, do touch on the topic of change management throughout this weekly episode, or this weekly podcast, I should say. But we've never done a episode fully dedicated to change management. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity here to pull the best of, you know, the best of the segments and clips and interviews that we've done so far on this podcast as it relates to change management. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting and your host here today. And uh, again, you can find this podcast every Wednesday, new episodes drop on audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And we also stream the video version of this podcast to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter every Wednesday morning uh, in the Americas, in the afternoon and evening throughout the rest of the world in Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. So thank you for listening here today. I really appreciate having you on the show. So what I thought we'd do to get started is let's, let's talk about what change management is. Uh, first of all, before I dive into that, I'm going to play you a clip from a YouTube video that I, I published. It's about a 10-minute clip that talks about what exactly change management is and just really getting back to the basics of what what the definition of change management is and some of the basic things you need to talk about. So I thought we'd sort of ease into the, the discussion here today as it relates to organizational change management. And uh, first of all, just to back up before I get to that clip, though, the reason change management is so important is because with today's emerging technologies and the rapid pace of technologies, the human side of change is more important than ever because technology is changing so fast. Our world is changing so fast, faster than ever. And humans' ability to keep up with that change hasn't really changed. So technology is changing faster than humans' ability to change. And so change management is a, is a, a uh, not an industry, but a, a field that is going to be more and more important, increasingly important as time goes on. So it's something that's always been important. It's something that's always been a passion of mine, but it's something that I only see getting more important, especially in today's day and age of focus on automation and artificial intelligence and some of the cool, sexy technologies that are out there. They're changing so much, and those technologies are so far ahead of where we are as humans that the change management component is going to be more important than ever. So that's the backdrop of why change management is so important and why we wanted to dedicate an entire episode of the show to organizational change management. But to get started, um, before we get to some of the guest interviews and playing you clips of the interviews, I thought what we do is play you a clip from my YouTube channel. It's a, a short video I published just a couple of years ago that talks about what is change management. It's a really basic sort of a change management 101 sort of a video, and I thought that'd be a great way to ease into it. So let's play that clip first, 
And as we're going through these discussions here today, by the way, we're going to include links to the full episode that features each of these discussions. So as we get through each of these guests and as I play you some of these clips and partial clips from these interviews, we'll also include a link below. So if you want to go listen to the entire interview or that entire episode, um, you'll have a link to go directly to that conversation if you want to dive into it. If you if you find a guest that's particularly appealing to you or there's a topic that's particularly appealing to you, but we don't play the whole clip here today, you can go listen to the entire uh, interview via the clips or via the links below. So be sure to check that out in the description field below. We'll include that. Um, in the notes to this podcast episode. So that all being said, let's jump in and dive in by playing you this clip of what is organizational change management. The thing with change management is that there's no one definition. There's no one standard way that change management is defined. And so I like to keep it really simple and define it on the surface as anything that is required to change people and to change your organization, to change your culture, anything to do with the people and human side of your business Anything to change that is what organizational change management is. So I'll talk in a few minutes in this video about what some of those tools and mechanisms are to change people. But the other part of change management is how to keep those people aligned. How do we keep our organization aligned and not just understanding what the change is, but being aligned on what the change is and why it's happening and what it means to all of us. So in a nutshell, if I were to summarize a starting point of what change management is, it's anything to do with changing people, getting them aligned, and ensuring that the organizational and human aspect of your transformation is being addressed. Now, in addition to making sure that your people, your employees, your overall organization is aligned, and actually as a prerequisite to that, you wanna make sure that your executives are aligned. A lot of times companies move forward with changes or transformations of some sort, without having clear executive alignment and definition of what this change means to the organization, why we're doing it, uh, what some of the key decisions are behind it. So our executives and also the key stakeholders within the organization need to be aligned on what this change is and how it's going to affect our overall organization. As an example, a lot of times we'll be hired by clients that will say, we want to standardize our business processes across the entire world. We're a global company, we want standard processes, we want everyone to act like one company. But what they don't realize is what the detailed decisions are behind that. What are the, the decisions that need to be made on what that exactly means to act like one company? Are there any exceptions to that? Is it a all or nothing type proposition or are we somewhere on a spectrum? Those are the types of things that a lot of times executives and stakeholders aren't aligned on. And when they start the transformation and then hand it off or expect the rest of the organization to follow, there's a lack of clarity and there's confusion around what that really means. So it's really important to define a framework and sort of a skeleton of what the change is, make sure that the executives and stakeholders are aligned on that skeleton so that we can continue to flush out the details with the rest of the organization going forward. Now, typically prior to change affecting employees, there is an identified change to a business processes or a set of business processes. So one of the first things we need to do in order to be effective at change management is to define what our changes to business processes are. And a lot of change management practitioners think that business process stuff is outside the realm of change management. They think that it's all about just dealing with the human side of things. But we also have to deal with the operational side of things because the human and operational side comes together along with technology to enable changes. And we have to understand what the changes to business processes are. We have to define that in detail. We have to define how technology is going to fit in, how roles and responsibilities are going to change, all that stuff that comes later. We can't do any of that until we've defined how processes are going to look going forward. So part of change management is by necessity, defining what those future state business processes are. So once we've defined what the business process changes are, we inevitably lead to the conversation of how are people's jobs changing. If I typically had responsibility for a certain amount of work and you're going to take some of that work away or you're going to add to my workload or you're going to give me a new technology to do my job or you're going to take away a spreadsheet that I've always used and obsessed over for 20 years, my job is changing and I need to understand what those changes are. And we as a change management team need to understand what those changes are so that we can communicate to people and help them transition through that change. 
Now, the thing about designing roles and responsibilities is that different people are affected and impacted differently. We work our way down from company-wide changes down to business units or locations, down to departments, down to individual work groups, and ultimately individuals. And we define what the changes to roles and responsibilities are for all of those different people. And a lot of times people think of change management as more of a shotgun approach where we just take a high level view of what the changes are. We send out some emails, we tell the management team and we call it good, but we have to get down to the real micro level of understanding how one individual person and each individual person's job may be changing. So that whole definition of roles and responsibilities is a cr critical component of change management. Now an often overlooked and hard to understand aspect of change management is culture. What kind of culture is it that you're trying to achieve with your organization? Are you trying to change your culture? Are you trying to become more of a flexible organization? Are you trying to become more of a customer centric organization, a more efficient organization? Whatever the general type of change you're going through is going to have an impact or should have an impact on your culture. And in order for us to change the culture, we have to change the people. And in order to change the people, we have to change the culture. So it's sort of a, a closed loop cycle. And so change management has to take culture into account. And we have to figure out what are the things we can do to start to bend the culture and start to influence the culture, recognizing that it's not going to happen overnight. And if we're trying to achieve a certain future state, it's going to take years or maybe even longer to get there. But we can start influencing that culture and, and directing people in that direction now. Now, the younger of a company you are, the easier a cultural change typically is. If you're a more established organization with highly tenured employees, it's going to be a bit harder to change that culture. But regardless, you still want to define what that culture is, and cultural change is a core component of change management. So when it comes to execution, the next component of change management is helping employees through the journey, helping them through the transition, helping them understand that this is our future state over here, here's where we are today, and how are we gonna help them migrate from point A to point B. And so it's really that execution part of defining how is it we're gonna help each individual person and each individual work group transition through the change throughout the organization. And again, this is gonna be something that's tailored to you Every change management plan and strategy and approach should be tailored for your organization. And watch out for cookie cutter approaches because cookie cutter, cookie cutter methodologies and tool sets typically don't work because they're cookie cutter and they aren't unique to who you are and who you're trying to become. So defining what that transition plan is and what the overall change transition plan is going to be is a very core and important part of what organizational change management is. And now the final major component of organizational change management that a lot of change, if not most change practitioners fail to recognize is benefits realization. How do we measure the results? How do we identify how our efforts should and will impact our actual company-wide performance? So if we're trying to become a more customer-driven, a customer-centric organization, for example, how is it that we're gonna measure and hold individuals accountable and how can we actually measure the results after the fact to see how successful we were in our change efforts so that we can modify and pivot and reinforce where needed. So benefits realization and that more pragmatic and tangible and quantitative side of change is extremely important and it's a bit different than the soft touchy-feely side of change management. It's very hands-on and tactical, but it's very important and something that oftentimes gets overlooked but benefits realization is the final major component of what organizational change management is or should be. Okay, so that is a basic definition of what organizational change management is, but there's a lot more details, a lot more depth that we want to get into in this episode, and that's what we're going to dive into next. Starting after a quick break, we're going to bring on our first guest to talk about some basics of organizational change management. We're going to bring on a member of the third stage consulting team, an organizational change expert, a pro size certified expert, someone who's been doing change management stuff for over 20 years. We're going to bring her on the show or at least play you a clip of when she was on the show last. 
where she talks about the basics of organizational change management. It's a good it's a good segue from what is change management into what are the basics, what are the building blocks of what change management is and what are the things we should be thinking about. So we'll bring Teresa on the show as soon as we take take a quick break. But first we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. This is the weekly podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy aspects of transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as on audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out if you don't already and subscribe to the show. Leave us a comment, review. We'd love to hear your feedback. So uh, we've talked about what change management is, but now let's dive into the basics of change management. Start to unpack it a bit more. And this next interview that I'm going to play you a clip from was back from episode number 105 of this particular podcast. I'm sorry, not 105. It's episode number 29. I'm way off. I'm looking at the wrong the wrong notes here. Uh, it's episode number 29. So this is going back to the first six months or so of this podcast back in 2021, and it's a, a timeless interview because in this interview with Teresa Richardson, who is a senior manager of strategy and transformation here at Third Stage Consulting, um, she was on the show just to talk about the basics of organizational change management. So it's a really good way to understand some of the fundamental building blocks of what should be included within a change management program and plan and strategy. And uh, it was great to have her on the show. And this this uh, episode number 29 was a great one because she did dive into some of those basics of change management. So let's roll you a clip from that interview from a couple of years ago, back from 2021, and uh, we'll come back after the break. And uh, again, if you want to see the full interview with Teresa, we're going to play you a clip right now, sort of a highlight of that interview. But if you want to see the full one hour ish interview with her or any of the other guests on the show, check the links in the show notes below, because the links will take you directly to the episode in the full interview uh, for each of these guests. So um, episode number 29 is the one that Teresa Richardson was on talking about the basics of organizational change management. Let's roll that clip. I guess a, a follow-up question to, to why change is so important. You know, why is it so hard? Why do, why do so many organizations struggle with change in general, especially as it relates to the human component? And I honestly think that, and again, I believe people don't come to work wanting to do a bad job. I just think that the education, the awareness of what it really is, isn't there. So um, even the conversation I had today with with a client, um, he came from Michigan. He understood, you know, manufacturing and, and the importance of getting in early, making sure these changes are identified and we have plans to do them. But a senior level management wasn't as passionate as he is at this point to address those issues. So getting the awareness of what change management is and how to implement when to implement and the best mitigators around the problem that that we can come up with is is why i feel people don't engage soon enough it's it's when you have the initiative rolling of process and technology and things aren't really moving to where they need to go and they ask why why is this happening and then at that point yes we come in and we help but it would have saved to your to your point time, money, resources had we gotten in earlier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, it, and the other thing that that does that approach that you're advocating of, of getting in earlier and addressing change management earlier is you get to see how big the bread box is. You know how much of a change or an impact is this really going to have 
I think a lot of times companies think, well, let's just wait until we get closer to go live and we think about training and yep. doing some of that downstream stuff, but they don't, but by then you've already walked into a, a mess of organizational challenges and pitfalls and risks. As, especially if you're uh, merging cultures. So, you know, you, you think that, okay, we have the best culture, but guess what? Those two other merger companies think they have the best culture. They have the best processes. So right from the onset, in, even in planning phase, you have a mindset that goes against what you're trying to create, which is one cohesive organization. So if you're only looking at the nuts and bolts and the process steps and trying to figure out, you know, which op which you need to follow as a as an organization, you miss all of those nonverbal cues, the, those unspoken attitudes and perceptions that once you do create a process or technology that you're going to have to address. You have to address it unless, again, your process is 99.99% automated, people are involved, and you need to address the people factor. So it, you just can't get around it. Or or you're going to pay now or pay later, right? So pick, pick your poison, right? Yeah. Well, let me take, let me play devil's advocate. I'm going to talk about a process that I might automate 99.99%. And you can tell me if there's a change impact here or not. But let's just say I'm using, uh, you know, artificial intelligence or robotic process automation, you know, one of these really cool technologies that are you know, offered as a standalone or that are integrated within, you know, enterprise technologies of different sorts, um, game changing stuff that could totally streamline a process or an operations. Um, does that mean that change management won't be important in that case or, or how would change, if so, if, if it is going to be important, how would change management fit into that? Something like that. So I guess, let me ask you a question. So you have a process that's evolved to, become more efficient, more automated, et cetera, right? So you've grown to a level. Now you need less people, but you're gonna need people. So when you're trying to get to that next level of generation or growth, it's not going to happen automatically. You're still gonna have people involved. You're still gonna need to understand, you know, what were the barriers? What were the, the problems? You know, what are the, the best opportunities, the best practice, et cetera? What are the results? How do you interpret the results? Are they, do these results make sense to the people involved? So there's still a component of people if you want to continue growing in your practice. Now, if you don't and you just want to level and, you know, stay there stagnant forever, I would say, you know, maybe you're going to have to figure out is the button to push by the human in the right place every time. I don't know. Right. <laughs> but, right. I mean, so I liken change management to dinosaurs, right? If you don't change, you're going to end up, dying out. If you don't evolve, you, you got to keep moving. And in, in business today, it's so quick. And in the speed is, is mind blowing sometimes. And if you're not capturing that, the change in the people uh, process technology, you're going to miss out. So our markets are driven by competition. You have to have a competitive edge. And honestly, from what I've seen, the competitive edge is our people. We have to give them the respect and the due diligence to understand how can we not only make our process and technology better, but how can we make our people better? How can we involve them? How can we grow ownership, accountability? Because they're the ones at the end of the day that produce the results. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I, I can't think, I can't remember how long I've been hearing the same comment from executives and project teams of, well, you know, we've got this change or this new technology, a process improvement that's going to allow people to do less manual work and focus more on the strategic aspects of their job. Mm -hmm. And it sounds good in theory, and maybe you, you plug in a number in your business case that somehow quantifies that. But what does that mean? You know, if I'm right. a, if I'm I'm an employee and you're bringing in artificial intelligence or any sort of technology to automate what I'm doing, and you're taking away some of my manual work that's low value, what does that mean for my job? Am I going to exactly am I, what 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 am I going to fill my time with if I'm not spending half my time doing manual stuff or whatever the case may be? So and that's again, a really good point. I think through through the evolution of growth, you know, we're taking to your example people who are engaged in manual work, and now you want to elevate them to more strategic, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
that's still going to assist your AI. It's still going to help your growth. But if you're not addressing the changes, even in their roles and responsibilities, you know, you have changes in reporting structure, changes in tools that you're using. They're going from manual to this. And what does that mean? And how do I connect to my new position? In my experience, most resistance comes from a place of not understanding what the change is, why are we doing it, and how is it impacting me? Once we address that, the ownership and accountability grows, and I've seen teams that have exploded, and I'm like, you know, that mama bird looking at her little birdies flying out and being all successful. It's the best feeling, I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing. And it just took someone to identify those opportunities, put a plan together, and work through it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what are some of the biggest pitfalls or change pitfalls you see from a from a change management perspective, typically when you're working with with our different clients? Um, so the first would be the time of inclusion of change management. So when when do we get to be part of the conversation? Um, traditionally, it's been midpoint or end, like a handoff type thing which again, we, we discussed earlier, that's a huge opportunity missed, right? And if we are lucky enough to get in at the ground level, right, to help build the foundation, because what happens when you build a foundation on sand, it kind of shifts, but you know, change management can help build a solid foundation. Um, the understanding of what change management is, an understanding of what the roles and responsibilities are from a change management perspective, in my opinion, is the next biggest opportunity as well as understanding how to communicate the changes at what levels, when are you gonna do it, um, and creating that community of change agents. Like one person cannot move a mountain. You need to create an army of people who believe in what you're doing, embrace the change, and help it move forward. You really need to. And then creating trust in your teams is so important. Um, walk the walk. Walk the walk. You know, if, if I tell you, you know, hey, Eric, I'm going to come to you every Friday and we're going to have a download. First couple of Fridays, we have our download. And the third one, it's skipped. I just broke your trust. And now anything else that I tell you, you're not going to accept. So you have to be able to have those things in place in order to continue growing your change management initiative. Right. And let me know if I talk a little fast because I kind of like get on my soapbox and run with it so <laughs> no that's that's important and those are those are some really good pitfalls and actually you triggered another question about um when you, when you were talking about you know not getting change management started uh at the right time when you think about when a a change program should start and when it should finish what what does that timing look like when when and where does it fit within an overall transformation how do we understand that Sure. So in my opinion, it's helpful to start at the inception of a project because having that change management scope and mindset, you're going to be asking questions that someone else might not have asked, right? You're coming from a different perspective. Um, and from my experience, you need to look at whatever it is you're doing from every angle to get every perspective you can so you can get ahead of the issues, right? Change management should be in the beginning, middle, and does it really end is the question, right? So you've just created this army of change agents that are excited and you know they're engaged and they own it and they're accountable. Do you really want as an organization to stop the momentum? Because change does not live in one project only. It's the way to grow your company. Because if I know that my ideas are going to be heard and maybe entertained, maybe something I come up with will be working and maybe it won't, I still know what I'm doing is I'm adding value to the company. I'm part of the company and its success and growth. If you cut that off at the end of a project, you are really doing a disservice to yourself because right. Human equity or human capital is what builds great companies. Right. Yeah, that's that's an important point. I mean, no matter what industry you're in or what kind of organization you have, um, that that human capital piece of it is important, especially in cases where you're trying to create a a culture that is going to make get people excited and you yeah, want absolutely. High and you want performance. 
And we get a lot of clients who will say, you know, we've got these high standards for our human capital management function and how we treat employees, the culture we're creating. But then they go to go through this sort of transformation and they totally underperform from a change yep. management perspective. They don't realize what, what a big impact this is going to be. So I, I think that's a good point. And especially in this climate, you know, you have a lot of talent looking for a place to grow and a place to flourish. And there's a lot of opportunity. So you companies, in my opinion, should capitalize on that and create atmospheres of inclusion. And we, we want to hear your ideas because, you know, like I said before, one man cannot move a mountain. It takes a team of, of people to work together, to understand the challenges, put solutions in place and make it happen. So, right. Yeah. And that's not well, always easy work. Yeah. Yeah. None of this is easy work. Otherwise, I guess more people would do it and more people would be successful at it. Okay. So that's just a taste of what we talked about with Teresa Richardson when she was on the show. Uh, Teresa, again, is a senior manager of strategy and transformation at Third Stage Consulting. And we had a great conversation that continued on beyond what I just played you, by the way. If you want to hear that whole episode, check the links in the show notes below or the description field of this podcast episode. We've included a link directly to that full interview if you'd like to go watch that episode and, and dive into more detail about the basics of organizational change management. But hopefully that gives you a flavor of what some of those basics are in the meantime. So when we come back, we're going to continue this best of discussion, the sort of compilation, this curated set of interviews as it relates to organizational change management. And we're going to bring on a very high profile guest within the world of change management. I think all of our guests are high profile, but this one in particular in the world of change management, someone that's very well known, uh, someone that works for a training organization that's very well known. And many of you listening might be certified in this particular program. I'll give away the secret of who that is when we come back from a quick break. But first, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 124. This is the change management episode where we are diving into the curated best of change management interviews in this podcast over the last two and a half years. And this was a very, uh, it wasn't difficult to find the content. It was difficult to narrow down the discussions to the ones that I thought were the best ones over the last two and a half years. And this one we're going to get to next, though, is uh, was sort of a no-brainer. It's someone we almost had to include on this episode. It wouldn't be a complete episode if we didn't include this person. And uh, many of you may be ProSci certified. You may be familiar with ProSci. If you're not certified, ProSci is an organizational change management uh, training and certification program and company. And back in episode number 55 of this podcast, we had Tim Creasy, who's the chief innovation officer of ProSci. So in other words, he designs much, if not all of the uh, training materials that ProSci puts out and, and uses for certification courses. And we had him on the show back in episode number 55, talking about the future of organizational change management, sort of wanted to talk about not just what is change management, what are those building blocks and the basics of it, but where are we headed with change management? Why is it so important? And how is change management going to look in the future? And it was a great conversation. And he's someone I would definitely like to have back on the show again to continue this conversation. But we had a great conversation back in episode number 55. So let's roll part of that clip with Tim Creasy of ProSci talking about the future of organizational change management. You know, maybe just to start, um, you know, when you when you look at the ProSci program and, and you guys deal with these organizations all over the world. Um, and, and by the way, before I get into this question, and this relates to a, a comment here that's on uh, LinkedIn. Um, you guys are a global, you offer this on a global scale, right? Uh, as far as the training, um, we've got a comment here that ProSci needs to step into Africa, but I, I believe you can get certified from Africa. Can you, can you not? 
Yeah, ProSci has, uh, again, uh, humble beginnings, right, in a small warehouse in northern Colorado uh, is kind of where I started. We now have a physical footprint uh, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, uh, Latin America, and Spain and Portugal. Uh, but there is an affiliate network around the entire globe where you can access ProSci training programs. So within Africa, we have several partners. Uh, and if you Google ProSci Global Partner Network, uh, you'll track down information about uh, Cedar and uh, and Change, uh, our friends that are down that way. Great, great. So I guess just to jump into here um, about you know the the problem statement that that you guys are trying to solve with with ProSci, and that is that the change is hard in general. Or if it, if this was easy. You and I probably wouldn't be in business, quite frankly. You and I would probably be doing, you'd be in economics and I don't know what I'd be doing, but it wouldn't be this probably. So, so change is hard. Organizations yeah. struggle with it. Why, why is that? You guys, you've seen so many organizations, you've certified so many people that are thirsting for, for learning about change, but why is it such a difficult discipline? Well, I think it gets back to that notion. And I've been talking about the two sides of the change coin, right? That there's a technical side of every change where we design, develop, and deliver a solution that meets the need, the issue, the opportunity in front of us. You do a lot of work with your clients doing ERPs, right? That's one flavor of technical solution. CRMs would be electronic health records in a hospital, merger, acquisition. Even a new value system is a technical side of a change, right? Hmm. The people side of the change is how do we get people to embrace, adopt, and use whatever that solution is. And although in this change discipline, if you've been a practitioner and you hear it called the soft side of change, you know, it just makes your skin crawl, right? Um, because I think the reason it's hard, Eric, is that this is the harder side of change. The technical side of change can be incredibly complex. Merging two big organizations, absolutely. There's technical complexity in terms of pulling this financial systems together, branding, blah, blah, blah. The real hard side of the change is getting people to step into this new way of working. It's mm -hmm. helping individuals navigate, step out of where they are today, step through whatever that transition, the liminal movement is going to be, and step into um, that new way of being. And so I, I think the reason it's hard is because the people side of change is the harder side of change. Now, historically, in a value system where your employees were incented for just you know asking how high when you told them to jump, you know, predictability, consist consistency, that was the value system historically. Um, change was easier then because the values aligned with what asking somebody to do something different. But new value systems over the last 20 years, the emergence of, you know, the, the interaction economy out of the service and knowledge economy, uh, these things have all amplified the people side of change as something that we cannot just leave up to giving the right uh, commands but it's really around helping people navigate uh, navigate that journey. And I know we're gonna end up talking about the pandemic too, but the pandemic just amplified. It made the people side of change impossible to ignore. If you were one of those organizations or projects that did ignore it and leave the people side of chance, change to chance, you know, historically. Yeah. Now, because we have a global audience, I, it might be worth asking, you know, a lot of those dynamics you just described, as far as the difficulty of changing and, and um, you know, the, the fact that in the past, maybe you could say jump and people just say how high, and that's not so much the case in today's uh, organizational cultures. Do you see differences in different parts of the world or just differing organizational cultures and how these pro sci concepts are applied or how they navigate change in general? Or, or how does that affect, you know, either a global culture and or an organizational culture? How does that affect, you know, your, your change journey? Yeah, I think you're spot on because I think culture is critically important. Um, I do get a little bit provocative here. I'll say that uh, culture is never the villain when a change fails and it's never the hero when a change succeeds. Uh, we're big, big Marvel fans at our house, right? So uh, culture is neither Thanos nor, nor Captain America. Um, culture is. It, it's the water in which we're swimming. Uh, and so I think great change practitioners, it's their job to understand, adapt, and adjust to the culture into which they're bringing to life this particular change. So I guess kind of that's my first bent. I do think culture, it, certainly we get geographic variation in culture, but inside of organizations, we also get tremendous variation of culture um, just because of the, you know, the values, behaviors, beliefs, 
we unpacked this with research. You know, this is kind of an interesting full circle notion of, of kind of the story of ProSci, where we have a, a, an attunement to the market, uh, a neat, an, an understanding that change at agents would like to better understand the culture they're stepping into and how it impacts the change journey they're about to attempt to navigate. And so we looked at a number of the different uh, studies, the work that was done on organizational cultures and came up with six cultural dimensions that impact how change comes to life. Because um, my other beef on the culture equation is that any of this kind of value laden, like good, good culture, bad culture, uh, culture is. And if it's not aligned with what you're trying to achieve as an organization, then you need to go about nudging the culture. It, it but it's, it, you know, so that's, I hate the good, the good, bad stuff kind of drives me crazy. So instead we went spectrums because change is kind of come to life different, right? So you take the first one to be, uh, perf let's say uh, uncertainty avoidance as a spectrum. Some organizations have a very low uncertainty avoidance, a high tolerance of ambiguity. Others have a, uh, the flip side, right? Neither is good nor bad, but they impact how change comes to life. And so we built a body of research that's contained in the ProSci, you know, body of knowledge that says for each of these six cultural dimensions, individualism, collectivism, what are the challenges uh, of bringing to life change in an individualistic culture? And what are the adaptations you need to make as a change practitioner? Hmm. What about for a collective culture, right? Uh, power distance. Is the organization this high or this high in terms of the orientation of where people think they need to get permission? Um, neither good nor bad, but this organization requires different change tactics than this organization. And yeah. so that's what we've built out in the research is this whole set of, for each of these dimensions, what are the challenges and adaptations you would make depending on where you live in that, uh, in that cultural phenomenon. Culture is going to be really fascinating going forward, I think, because, you know, I've spoke a lot in the last couple of years about the involuntary digital transformation. Mm -hmm. that, that's what happened in March of 2020, right? For all the talk of all the executives, of all the clients you help, right, about uh, digital transformation leading up to March 2020, uh, they were mostly enamored with the technological revolution. Uh, and then all of a sudden we saw the digital transformation happen during this instantaneous work from home experiment. Um, the cultural transformation that organizations have in front of them cannot be allowed to be involuntary, right? We, we need to make sure that we step out in front of shaping the organizations that we want to, to live in and be part of as organizations going forward. Yeah, it, it's, it, it creates that thing that change initiatives oftentimes have historically struggled with, which is that burning platform for change. Like, why do I, if I'm an employee working for you, Tim, why do I need to change? I mean, why do we need to change? Why are you doing this to me? You know, that, that sort of thing. And it sort of takes that conversation off the table and makes it a little less personal and more like this is, we're all kind of in this together and we're all trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this new post pandemic world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, just a, a uh, just a couple of comments here. One that's sort of relevant to what we were just talking about, and that is from uh, Malcolm on LinkedIn. Um, so his comment here is that uh, many companies will happily spend money on consultancy and technology. And there's a there's part two here, um, but not on education. Why and training? How? Um, so I guess that begs a question, or maybe I'll sort of spin that into a question that it triggered is. So companies are spending all this money on technology because they have to, or, you know, it's that involuntary transformation that you're talking about. Um, they spend all this money, in many cases, tens of millions of dollars for, for a larger organization, maybe even more for a really big one. So, uh, but they're not spending that, a lot of them are not spending adequate time and money on the education and the, the overall change management. What, it, it sort of goes back to my first question. Why, why is that? I mean, why do you, is it, a, is it a blind spot of executives? They just don't understand anything beyond the soft side of change that you were talking about or what, what do you think that dynamic is yeah and i think uh you're right and i had to build on malcolm's comment the other one that we watch uh, organizations fall into is we never find the money to spend to do it right the first time yeah but we always find the money to do it the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth time and so i think a lot of this is around getting smarter with how we're going to implement change and position change in the organization. One of the things we started to do, Eric, back in about 2013, 14, we introduced our ROI of change management, a calculator, a whole frame. But um, 
I wrote a paper one time, I never published it, I think I should. It's about, it, for human beings to make sense of anything, we need context and contrast. So here's a new idea that I'm trying to help you understand. Con text is how does it relate to the stuff around it? Contrast is how is it similar or different to the something I already know? And I think when we talk about the value of change management, we've unfortunately done it in absence of the context of the real value it's going to create. Hmm. And so we started to really work to shift this language to, um, I started using the phrase people dependent project ROI. Hmm. What percentage of the project's ROI depends on people adopting and using the solution? It's somewhere between zero and a hundred percent. Um, and one of my biggest pet peeves in the entire world is when people use the word literally incorrectly. But if you want to watch a project leader's gears or a senior leader's gears start to turn, ask them what percentage of this project's ROI depends on people adopting and using the change. And for our most important, most strategic projects, that number is 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, right? Out of the gate. Hmm. And then we can ask the second question, which is what are we investing in driving the adoption and usage of the solution? And often it's, we have $500 for mouse pads and coffee mugs. Uh, and so we've created that cognitive dissonance, right? That so much of the value of the change depends on adoption and usage, but historically we've not right-sized our investment in supporting the adoption and usage of that change. Um, and I think Eric, this is, you know, a couple of the, my fun turns of phrase here uh, that I played with is getting past the head nod. Mm -hmm. So that's one, right? Um, Cause you know, 20 years ago when ProSci was really at the beginning of that change management journey, change management was still kind of the crazies in the corner. We hadn't even got the head nod, but over the last 10, 15 years, you know, things have certainly shifted. And so now you're like, oh, we need some change management on this. And oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. And I need an hour on the agenda. Whoa, 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 whoa. You need an hour of my time? I told you this change management stuff sounded good, right? Uh, and so getting past the head nod is that, you know, it sounds good until, no, you need me to do something different. Uh, and that's where we test. Are we dealing with a passive buy-in? You know, I'm passively bought into change management or active buy-in by that senior leader that they're willing to take the steps and make the investment to support the adoption and usage of the, of the change. The other position, positional shift that we'll work, here, work at here is, you know, that change management's an investment, not an expense. Yeah. If we see it as an expense line, uh, it gets LIFO'd all the time. And do you have any supply chain background? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the audience does. LIFO is last in, first out, or it's a way to manage uh, inventory. It's also, unfortunately, what happens to change management on the agenda, on the budget. Mm -hmm. That if we've not anchored our value to the achievement of the project ROI, we're the last on the budget, the first off the budget, last on the agenda, first off the agenda. Um, but as soon as we start to anchor to the percentage delivery of that, that project ROI, um, that's the position shifter. I, have, I was working with this team, Eric. So uh, a team in an IT, right? IT project team rolling out a big project. We sat down with them and we all did the uh, CM ROI calculator. So the change management ROI calculator. We go through and you put in all of the benefits and objectives of the project, how people dependent each one is. You do this big weighting. Uh, out at the end comes the number 62%. So the team collectively arrived at a calculation that 62% of the project ROI depended on adoption and usage. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a betting man, but I would put money on the fact that it's not 62%, right? Fire. Just based purely on statistics, it's more likely 61 or 63 or 60 or 64, or like just a normal distribution. Um, but all of a sudden they had a label, right? They and they began talking about the 62% in meetings. You know, are we, do, how are we doing on the 62%? Do we think we're lined up? Are we ready to, you know, do we have that part of the organization moving to make sure we capture this, the 62%? They had a label for this concept of the people dependent portion of the project ROI. And it unlocked the conversations, it unlocked mm -hmm. the way that they began to intentionally engage the people in the organization because it wasn't just a communication and a training plan anymore. It was, what do we do to make sure we capture the 62% of this transformational technology we're rolling out? And so that, you know, that, that context shifting, I think is 
where we get out of the, well, we don't, is it nice to have maybe? Um, I also think the pandemic proved that change management is not a nice to have anymore as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it disrupted people's worlds in a way that I think a lot of people can sort of see it and feel it and understand it a little bit better. Okay, great stuff. That's a, a great conversation and a great start to the conversation that we had with Tim Creasy from ProSci. And if you want to watch that full interview, you can go back to episode number 55 of Transformation Ground Control, this very podcast, and you can watch that entire hour-long interview. I've also included a link in the description field below in the show notes of this podcast episode. So be sure to check that out. If you want to hear the whole interview, you can go directly to the links in the description field below. But uh, Tim Creasy from ProSci, thank you for being here. I appreciate it having him on the show talking about the future of organizational change management. Now we're going to continue this change management thread in discussion for the next bit. And the next discussion we're going to have is actually a client of Third Stage Consulting, uh, the first of a, a couple uh, clients that we're going to have on the show. And uh, it is a really cool company that's a current client of Third Stage. So we're actively involved in their journey as we speak. And it's a company that's involved in the music industry, which if you know me or if you've listened to my stuff for any period of time, you probably know that I'm very much into classic rock and rock and roll and music in general and named a company called Third Stage Consulting after rock and roll. And uh, it's only fitting that we would have someone in the music industry one of our clients on to talk about how to create a culture of innovation. So we're going to give away the secret of who this is, what the company is, which is a very cool company. So stick around. We're going to have that guest on the show here in just a moment. But first, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. A man after 17 years, that's what he goes there for. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 124. This is the weekly podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy aspects of transformation. And of course, as part of the people aspect of transformation comes the world of organizational change management, which is the focus of this week's episode. Our next guest I'm very excited for. He's a first time guest on the show. He's the most recent guest on our show. In fact, he was actually just on the show last week. So this is back from episode number 123, which is last week's episode. And this is Drake Coker, who is the CEO of a company called Nashville Record Pressing. And they are a division of a conglomerate based out of the Czech Republic that produces vinyl records. So they own proprietary equipment, and they're one of the few owners of this equipment and the few manufacturers of vinyl records. So if you still buy records, as I do, you can see behind me, I have a, a painting of a, a record cover that uh, Third Stage is named after. And I collect vinyl myself. I, I collect all kinds of music, not only because I love the sound of vinyl, but I think it's just really cool to own something nostalgic like that, especially if it's a kind of music I grew up with or just remember from my childhood. I love having the record and sort of a, a physical copy of that. It's it just, to me, it's a lot different and more rewarding and satisfying than just streaming it on a digital device. So I, I like seeing the liner notes. I like seeing the, the lyrics in the sleeve. I like the smell of vinyl. It has a very distinct smell, almost like a physical book does. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sensory overload that I get from listening to vinyl. So very cool to have this company as a client, Nashville Record Pressing, and even cooler to talk to their CEO, who's a very visionary person, and he's taking an industry that is somewhat nostalgic and may, you could even argue outdated, even though vinyl is making a bit of a comeback, especially uh, in the indie music uh, scene and whatnot. Um, but it's still an, an industry that's been around for a long time, and, and it hasn't changed a lot. But the CEO of Nashville Record Pressing is creating a culture of innovation. And so we thought it'd be great to chat with him about the current journey he's on right now 
and what he's doing, not just from a technology perspective, but more importantly, from a people and organizational and culture perspective to create that culture of innovation. So this is Drake Coker, the CEO of Nashville Record Pressing. Let's roll the clip with him. So let's talk about this topic here that that uh, I think this was your idea, actually. This The, the words uh, <laughs> digital transformation is dead, I think, is, is your idea. And I love it because it's it's controversial. It's it, I think it makes you wonder, well, what, what in the world do you mean digital transformation is dead? And that's what we're going to get into. But I also like it, too, because it's sort of a, a riff on the rock and roll, you know, rock is dead uh, quote from – the doors of the who, you know, insert rock band that quoted that phrase here, Um, you know, long live rock, you know, rock is dead, long live rock, you know, that whole controversy that's been going on for decades sort of fits in here at digital transformation is, is digital transformation dead? I'd be curious to hear from the audience. Do you think digital transformation is dead? Do you think uh, the way we've been doing it is sustainable? Is it the right way? Is there something else that's uh, on the, on the horizon? I'd love to hear kind of the audience feedback here. And before I, um, ask you maybe to describe what you think uh, around this whole thread of, of digital transformation being dead, Drake. Uh, I'll, I want to turn to the audience real quick and just uh, recognize where some of the people are joining from today. We have people joining from all over the world, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Los Angeles, your old stomping ground, Drake. We have someone from Los Angeles, Denver, Colorado, Pakistan, India, uh, Denver, Colorado again, UK, Vietnam, Naperville, Illinois, Ethiopia, India, Egypt, Doha, Dubai. Dallas, Texas, a uh, lot of uh, global global participation here today. So thank you, everyone, for joining and being part of this uh, digital transformation community um, here today. And if you have any questions for Drake as we get going here, I'd love to hear your, your comments. And I'd also love to hear comments about, is digital transformation dead? And for that matter, is rock dead? You know, is, is vinyl dead? I don't know. There's, there's a lot of questions we have here, a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but maybe just to get started on this whole thread, then, Drake, um, your vision for Nashville Record Pressing is to be more than a record pressing company. What tell us a little bit about the longer term vision of the company and, and what really what is it you're trying to build? And you and I have talked a bit about this in you know our client related work, our clients in consulting relationship. But tell us a little bit about the vision of the company and, and what is what is it you're trying to do and what is it you're trying to build? Yeah, so let me see if I can do this rather briefly. Um, frankly, you know the goal for for uh, NRP is to be the best record pressing plant in the world. Um, and uh, perhaps the best record pressing plant that's ever existed in the world, you know, um, in, inside of this group that we're very fortunate to be part of and in service of, of, of the group's success. Um, th- part of this is about the, this an unusual set of sort of causes and conditions that existed around how um, this company has been created and how we've been able to grow it. Um, and then part of it's about sort of what's going on um, uh, specifically around vinyl and in the world. And then some of it's also about sort of what's going on in the world in terms of technology um, mm-hmm. and even digital transformation. And so putting those things very quickly together, um, it, it, you know, we are absolutely a startup, um, but we are a startup that has been unbelievably blessed from the beginning with capital support, um, uh, we're, we're in a situation where we have literally years of runway in front of us where every record that we produce is already pre-sold and wrapped up inside of um, capacity agreements that we have across the group with our larger customer. Uh, we have all kinds of operational and technological support. Um, we have access to, to vinyl record presses, which is a, 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 you know, a, a very rare thing. Um, and so we've had this confluence of events where Yes, we're we're starting this thing from scratch, and obviously, uh, everything that we do has to be built. But we get to s- literally stand on the shoulders um, of our group and sort of everything that's come before. So we're it's 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 like we're getting we're getting catapulted forward, and it's it's really I think our obligation to take tremendous advantage of those resources and momentum, and to try to maintain our vision and our balance and make the most out of it. To, 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 to leapfrog as far into the future as we can, right? That's sort of what's going on with us. What's going on inside of, 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 of music and vinyl is, is that there's a tremendous amount of love for it. Um, it's, uh, this, this revival has been demand-driven. It's been pulled by the marketplace, right? Um, and the industry really got out of the business of making records. And making records is hard. It's complicated. It's hard. Um, it's, 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 it has quite a bit more engineering and technicality in it that I think most people recognize and a lot of art, right? And so 
being able to it, it's so it's difficult to bring records to market and it's difficult particularly to bring more and more titles to market so a second piece of this vision is how we can not only be really just good at the basic functions but how we as a company and as a group can provide more and more services to our customers to help get more and more titles into the marketplace um, and provide you know access to the people that love and and, and, and buy and collect vinyl to a much broader swath of the catalog. And in so doing, hopefully continue to reignite and, and refuel their love for vinyl um, and then you know, continue to drive the market forward as, as a whole. Um, mm. But the third piece of this is just we're, we're living in an incredibly transformational time in, in my view. And, and I think that it's, it, it challenges me personally and professionally and, and it challenges an awful lot of people that I have a tremendous amount of respect for to, to, to really accurately gauge how much change is, is in the works right now, broadly. And I think that if you can look it squarely in the face, uh, it, 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 there's an opportunity and, and probably in, in my situation, a responsibility to ask some big questions, which is not only how far can we go, but more importantly, in what direction do we want to go? And what's the what's what are we actually trying to create, right? And how can right. how can technology in this change be a tool that helps bring more intentionality um, and 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 I would say human centered vision to what we're building, uh, rather than just trying to like hang on for dear life and see where we end up, right? Right. Um, and so you put those three things together. Um, some of that's very tactical. Some of it's very strategic. Some of it's very sort of uh, like long term, um, but uh, but it's but it's, a, but it's a combination of those uh, 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 and a confluence of, of those particular conditions and situations that we're using to to shape and drive the vision around what we're doing with um, with NRP. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, it's exciting to to think about, and it's a pretty innovative way to think about you know building a company and especially in a, in an industry that's as fast changing as uh, vinyl. Cause in some ways vinyl, the technology or, or the product hasn't changed a ton, at least the way I see it, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem like the product itself has changed that much over, over decades, but the industry has gone through a tremendous amount of change. As you mentioned, the beginning with AM radio and um, you know, peer sharing and um, CDs and digital delivery of, of music, just a lot of disruption to the industry in general. Um, how do you see digital transformation? I'm going to use that term pretty loosely, um, but the term digital transformation, how do you see that concept enabling the vision that you just described in those three different uh, pillars of your, of your strategy? Well, I, I think if for, for us, what we're trying to do is stay very involved with what's going on day to day and inside our business. And I said, we've just launched a new ERP system. It was something that we've wanted from the beginning. Our parent has been running an ERP system for about 18 years. They have highly customized it and augmented to it over time, right? Um, and so what we're getting is a, you know, is, is, is a rather well vetted um, implementation that's taken quite a bit of work to retool for, for what we're doing here in Nashville, which is which, you know, in terms of the nuts and bolts of the business is fairly different than what's happening um, with our parent in the Czech Republic, right? And so we're in this, we're in this, we're, we're discovering the system, we're learning what it does, we're learning what it doesn't do, we're learning what we like and what we don't like. And this is a very, you know, this is a very like in the weeds, moment to moment, day to day activity, right? But it would be easy for us to just sort of stay on that path. Um, become more and more connected to that ERP system, um, you know, upgrade it to, to, um, uh, to kind of the current version that is out there and figure out how to pull in all these changes that have been made and just kind of ride that train, just sort of, mm. just sort of ride that train without much thought. Right. And so the right. question that we've been asking is like, wait a second, wait a second, where is this train actually leading? Right. And, and, and how does this train compared to the other trains, planes, and automobiles that are available to us, particularly in a time when technology is changing in such a fundamental way, right? And 
how do we extract as much advantage and as much benefit and as much value as we can out of, of what we've got, right? But, but how, do we, how do we create uh, um, a real vision about where we wanna go? Which I think is about, at least really practically, is, is creating a bit of distance from, mm-hmm. from, from what we are managing day to day and really, you know, this is kind of a terrible analogy, but, you know, trying to work from a clean sheet of paper as much as possible and say, okay, what do we want this company to be? What do we want this company to be in 10 years and 20 years and 50 years? What role do we want it to play? What role do we want it to play to our customers? What role do we want it to play um, to our community? What role do we want it to play um, uh, to vinyl, right? Um, uh, and, and, and music. And, and really what role do we want it to play in the lives of the people that are, you know, um, are investing um, really their lives and helping to build it, right? And for me, I think what's been amazing about this experience is, is sort of, is, is how these things have come together to create the opportunities that we're facing. We're very, very fortunate as a company. Um, uh, you know, these things just don't always come together. And, you know, we are never going to be a company that employs a thousand or 5,000 or 10,000 people. We are not going to be a company that, you know, is trading on four continents. Um, uh, there's there's, there's going to be some limits. So I think that there's this sense like, okay, how do we grow this thing and how do we grow it into something that's really a powerful source of support um, for all the people that we're connected to, right? Mm-hmm. And what does that really look like? And then working backwards from there. And I, I, I mean this even in specific ways, like saying, okay, in five years from now, we expect to be seeing X amount of revenue run for, through this company. You know, and we would like to run this company with a leadership team of this size. And we would like the roles of the leadership team in terms of um, responsibility and content, um, but also balance to look like this. How do we then put the technology underneath it to be able to, 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 to actually bring that reality to life, right? So that we get something that's designed around people um, that, are, that are taking care of it every day rather than the other way around, right? And right. I think that that's oftentimes where um, things break down. When, where in my experience, it's easy to lose the forest for the trees. All right. Great stuff. Good conversation. There's a lot more that we didn't get to in this clip that we just played you. So if you do want to hear that entire interview, I encourage you to go back to episode number 123, which is last week's episode where we interviewed Drake talking about uh, the topic was actually digital transformation is dead. So we're talking about how the technology aspects of digital transformation is overrated and how in order for digital transformation to survive into the future and businesses to survive in the future, They need to stop focusing so much on technology and focus more on innovation, culture, and the people aspects of change. So I highly encourage you to check out that full interview if you enjoyed that particular clip. And uh, thank you, Drake, for being on the show. And uh, we're going to shift gears and continue to talk about change management, but a slightly different angle here. And next, we're actually going to dive into um, the change management consultant hot seat. So we're going to have another team member from Third Stage Consulting. He's actually a practice lead here at Third Stage. He's a change management expert. He's been doing change management for a long time. And we thought we'd put him in the hot seat and just ask him a bunch of questions about change management. No real focus other than the fact that it's change management related. We wanted to have at it with uh, questions I had as well as questions that the audience had. So we uh, will have uh, our guest on the show next. And I'll tell you who that here is here in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, 
Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 124. This is the very special change management episode where we are playing you the best of change management interviews and discussions in this podcast. Our next guest is actually someone you're going to see again later in the show. In fact, the next segment after this one, you'll see him as part of a panel discussion. Uh, but this is Nate Stroer, and Nate is a practice lead here at Third Stage Consulting. And in addition to being a practice lead, he is focused very much on change management. That's sort of his background and his biggest strength as a consultant is helping organizations with the people side of change management. And we thought it'd be great to have him on the show. This is back in episode number 65. If you go back to podcast episode number 65, we had Nate on the show just to be in the hot seat. We thought, let's just get a consultant to be on to talk about change management. No real focus in any discipline within change management, but more generally focused in, in let's just bombard him with questions for lack of a better description. So that's exactly what we did. We had Nate on the show. I asked him a bunch of questions and the audience asked a bunch of questions as it relates to change management. So let's roll the clip. And this is a really good conversation because it's, it's pretty free flowing and it covers a lot of ground within the world of change management. So let's go ahead and roll the clip. It really is sitting down and just saying, realistically, where are we and, and how ready are we for the change? And do we know what the change needs to be? And do we know what we want in the future? Yeah. Yeah, that's well, well put. And a lot of the work we do at third stage is, uh, unfortunately, is, is project recovery. You know, things that are either a project has gotten off track or it's, it's headed in the wrong direction or it's completely failed. And we get hired to come in and sort of have a SWAT team come in and fix it, basically. And, and one of the things we find from a change management perspective is it really, really two things or two major buckets of recommendation. I would add to what you said, Nate, is one is you, you mentioned the assessment, kind of understanding where they're at. But but also prioritizing and understanding where the biggest change risks are. You know, if there's certain groups within the organization that are particularly vulnerable to resistance to change or their buy-in is particularly important. And if we don't get that right, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. So that helps you prioritize and say, okay, if we're going to go attack a certain problem or area, let's prioritize. We can't boil the ocean times, you know, too much time has gone by. We're not going to be able to do a, a full blown proper, you know, comprehensive change management plan, but, we can go in and, and sort of prioritize and really attack those areas that are either the biggest risks or the biggest uh, opportunity to improve in a short period. The other thing, and this is probably the less popular option, but I think more organizations should really be honest with themselves and ask themselves this, is instead of saying, how do we force fit change management into this time frame, this, li this limited amount of time we have left, maybe you say, we're not going to do that. We're going to actually push out the go live and we're going to take longer to do this. We're going to tell our system integrator, our software vendor to slow, you know, slow their role. They're, we're going to go to a slower burn rate with them. We're going to cut back their team and we're going to redirect some of those resources to change management. Um, people don't like talking about that, partly because the system integrators put an enormous pressure on you not to do that because it affects their cash flow, you know, their revenue. And they want you, they just want you up and running on technology as fast as possible, regardless of what business value you do or don't get out of it. So more organizations, I think, in my opinion, have to look at that themselves in the mirror and say, this is my organization. This is my business. I'm going to do what's right for me. And that may entail doing the unpopular decision of pushing out a go live and saying, we're not going to go live in three months or whatever it is. We're going to go live in nine months. And we're going to give ourselves that extra time to really get this change management stuff right. Make sure we've got a clear, clearly defined business processes, all that stuff. Because chances are, if you're running late on change management, there's probably a lot of other things you're probably not, <laughs> you're, you haven't gotten to as well. It's usually not just a change management delay or a change management uh, coming in too late. It's usually, oh, yeah, we haven't done, you know, we, we're behind on testing. We're behind on all this other stuff. So you really want to look at that realistically and say, is that worth the risk? Because you have to you have to quantify that and say, if we d completely disrupt our operations and we can't ship product or we can't service our customers, that's a huge cost to us potentially. So let's let's get that right. So anyway, that's, I just add that to, to your comments there, Nate. Um. So I guess maybe just to sort of um, wrap this all up and sort of bring it all full circle, um, if if an organization is either midstream in a transformation or they're about to start a transformation in the early in the process, regardless of where they are, how do you recommend that project teams get started the change management process? What are some things they could start doing today, you know, from a change management perspective? I, I, I think the, the most important is, is to... Um, Actually, the, the number one step is is really sitting down and defining and assembling the right team. And that is making sure you have the right representation, starting at the executive level all the way down. So 
um, you know, it's often overused phrase, and I think a lot of people use it without thinking about it, but it's really figuring out who are the best change agents going forward. And that doesn't have to be the person that's the smartest technology wise, but it's really, it's really getting that team together from a leadership point of view and from a functional point of view of the, the people that are going to be most important to help you drive the change forward. People that use the system on a daily basis, people that understand the business, understand where their function fits into the entire organization. And it's putting together that team. <clears throat> I think the second, the, the often overlooked piece is communication. And it's really sitting down and, and developing a method of communicating with the team and with the organization as a whole. And, and while I think it often has the wrong sound when we say control the message and deliver the message how you want it, I think it's very important to sit down and let people know where you are, where you're going, and to communicate with them regularly and, and, and get, you know, take care of the fact or take control of the message so people know here's where we are and here's where we're going and here's how we're going to get there. And then I think third and, and final step is, again, really sitting down and being realistic on where we are and not, <clears throat> not sugarcoating it, not, you know, not saying, well, we think we're here or we think we could get here. Just sit down and say, where are we? And if you're in a, um, you know, as, as bad of a position as you are, the more realistic you are in realizing where you, where you are and where you want to be, the more you're going to increase your chances for success, the more you're going to put yourself in a better position to succeed in the future. That was a clip from a conversation back in episode number 65 of Transformation Ground Control, where we interviewed Nate Stroer and put him in the hot seat to talk about change management and change management consulting. And if you'd like to watch that full interview, which goes on for another 45 minutes or more uh, beyond what you just saw, you can go back to episode number 65, or just as is the case with all the guests here on today's show, you can check out the description or the show notes for this podcast episode for links to take you directly to the full interviews. Uh, back in those those podcasts that they're pulled from or from those episodes that they're pulled from. So thank you, Nate, for being here. And we're going to have Nate back on right after we take a break along with another team member from Third Stage Consulting. And in this discussion, we are going to provide a case study. We're going to dive into a specific case study for a global transformation and a really complex transformation and some pretty heavy-duty organizational change management type stuff. And what's really interesting about this case study, too, by the way, is not only do we cover change management, but we also cover a lot with process improvement in that interview because so much of what we did for this client uh, over our year and a half engagement with them was we helped them manage their organizational change work stream, but we also helped them with the operational and business process improvement pieces of things, which are very interrelated. So uh, it's a good secondary benefit of listening to this conversation is that you'll see how change management and business processes integrate to one another. But we're going to get into this change management lessons learned and case study here in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 124. This is a very special episode focused on organizational change management. The best of, the curated interviews that I've hand-selected for the best of discussion that we're going to have here today. And the good news is we had about two and a half years of content to go sift through, and we cover change management a lot on this podcast. So if you don't listen to the show regularly, and if you're interested in organizational change management, I highly encourage you to check this podcast out every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter as well as on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, including Amazon, Google, uh, Spotify, Pandora, et cetera. So be sure to check us out wherever you listen or watch the podcast. And this next guest, or these two guests that are going to be in this next clip we're going to play for you, 
is back from episode number 81, where we dived into or delved into a change management lessons learned and case study with one of our clients. So these two uh, team members from Third Stage worked on this particular client and this particular project, and we thought it'd be fun to unpack that particular case study as it relates to organizational change management. So with that all being said, Nate Stroher, who was just on the show here a moment ago in the previous clip, uh, as well as Cameron Carpenter, who is a senior consultant, or actually he's a manager now at Third Stage Consulting. I think at the time of this interview, he, was, he hadn't yet been promoted to that level, uh, but uh, Cameron Carpenter is on the show in this particular clip as well. So let's roll the clip where we provide a deep dive into a case study of one of our clients as it relates to change management. Great to have you all. Thanks for being here. And, and uh, speaking of topics we're passionate about, I think we can all agree that we're passionate about change management. So we wanted to uh, take this case study, which is interesting in a lot of ways, because a lot of times on this show and on this podcast, we'll sort of do case studies after the fact, after the project's completed, you look back and reflect on what went well, what didn't go well, what were some of the lessons learned. But this one's a little bit different because we're right in the midst of the transformation right now. So it's a little bit more of a in the trenches sort of a, a feel. And that's really what I wanted to get after here today. And today's discussion is sort of the the good, the bad, the ugly of what's happening right now, you know, as you guys are going through this transformation with our client. So I guess just to start out, and we can't, you know, obviously, hopefully the audience understands we can't share the client name or any sort of confidential information, but we can share a bit about the organization, some of the challenges and that sort of thing without mentioning them by name or without giving away who who the organization is. But without giving away who the organization is, Nate, um, tell us a little bit about the clients, what it is they do, what industry they're in, that sort of thing, as well as the scope of their their digital transformation, just to start us off. And then we'll we'll kind of get into some of the change management specific questions. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, our, our client is a, a billion dollar plus uh, multinational chemical manufacturing organization. And they called us in in the middle of a um, the implementation of a tier one ERP platform. They um, <clears throat> have had uh, several technology initiatives that have been very successful, some that have been very challenging. Uh, we were called in specifically uh, for our change management expertise and to help guide them through uh, the, the change management initiative and to really put in place a structured change management program and initiative to help them not only with this technology uh, implementation, but down the road, post implementation, go live and post go live support. Okay, great. That's a good a good overview. And um, so, I guess just to start, um, again, coming at this from a change management and a, and a human side of change perspective, how big of an impact or change is this transformation in general having on the organization? And, and Cameron, let's start with you. I know you guys all have opinions on all these topics, but we'll, we'll start with you, Cameron. Uh, well, it's a, I'd say that this organization is experiencing pretty large impact um, globally. It's uh, uh, it's a large solution. It's moving from an on-prem to cloud-based. There's a lot of difference in the way the system is structured and, and handles their current processes. So it's just very complex. There's a lot of moving pieces. And like like I said, global meaning you're you're working with different countries with different uh, compliance and, and regulatory requirements and needs, potentially different processes in to work and manage a project of that size uh, truly takes a strong governance structure from a project perspective in managing it. So it's 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 a significant change to this organization. And is that the sort of just out of curiosity? Is that the that sort of project governance or the general governance that you're talking about? Is that something that's new to this organization, or is that something they already had the competency and now they're just sort of building on that to to make the transformation more successful? I'd say it's a little of both. It's it seems that they set up the governance structures typically for their projects, but I think mm -hmm. they've made a, a a different focus on this one with having the change management lens. Um, uh, it, they've kind of usually been a technical driven company, uh, and that kind of ties into the culture, right? It's it's where they've been, and so when Nate alluded to some of the project successes they've had and some of the the uh, let, we won't call them letdowns because they were successful, but as far as they completed them, but they were IT driven and they didn't have a business focus. So I think that's the key with the new governance structure, along with the fact that they've taken those past experiences and if, if realized the benefit of change management or change leadership, which I'm sure we'll get into a little more, 
uh, and that's now a new component to this where we're working with both the technical and the business side. Got it. Okay. That, that makes total sense. So, so Nate and Mitch, anything you'd add to the mix as far as how big of a change or impact this has been on the organization? The one thing that I would add in there is, you know, coming from an environment where they have their legacy system that was completely customized to meet their needs to the out of the box type of model. Um, they're running into significant challenges in trying to fit what they've been doing for the last you know, 10, 12, 20 years into what they're doing today with an out of the box solution. So um, lots of processes that we need to be reviewing, evaluating, understanding what you're doing today and what you're trying to accomplish tomorrow. And, right. you know, the one thing the one thing I'll add and Cam hit on it a little bit, but I'll elaborate on it. And Eric, I think you can you can um, attest to this as well. We're, we're seeing so many folks and so many organizations that are interested in change management, change leadership initiatives, because traditionally IT projects, uh, platform imp implementations, any digital transformation has been driven and almost exclusively performed by the IT department. And, and there's our client has really seen some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges that have come out of that in the past. And this is really a chance for them to get the organization involved. And we're going to hit on this later down um, in, our, in our discussion, I'm sure. But it's it's really trying to get people to say, you know, this is this is something we need your input and we need you to be involved. And you can't just say lift and shift and we'll train you how to use this platform. You need to be involved in setting this up and you need to be involved in the change from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great point. So, so to address some of these challenges that you guys have mentioned, as far as the impact or the change to the organization, what, you know, what, if we just sort of back up or start at the highest level here and, and work our way down into the details, you know, what, what's the general change strategy in particular for this, for this digital transformation? You know, what, what sort of approach are we taking or how did we maybe, how did we get started? You know, that might be a good place to start. What, what are your thoughts on that, Mitch? Yeah. So really we got started and our whole goal when we first engaged with the client was to just understand where they're at. And our change management strategy has really been to meet the client where they're at and to help to identify any, any pitfalls that we're seeing on where they're going. Um, and to make the, the deliverables that we're putting in front of them relevant. Um, you know, we, we talked with some of their experience. I mean, they're, they're a large company. They've worked with, you know, Big Four and basically any consultancy out there. And what's been different about us and our strategy has been we're not shoving a methodology down their throat. We are really trying to understand them, navigate their people. We're trying to navigate their structures um, and we're trying to meet them where they are and, and to just help them along the way. Yeah, great point. I think a lot of a lot of organizations and project teams forget that or just intentionally uh, ignore where they're at. You know, they, they sort of focus on let's get to the future state. We know we're going to change our culture. We know we're going to change our way of doing business, which is partially true. But you have to understand where you're starting from in order to, to get there. So that's a really good, a good observation or point. Um, how about... Uh, Cam or, or Nate, anything to add in terms of the general, you know, sort of the general change strategy in addition to meeting the client where they are today and, and helping them start to migrate to where they're headed? Nate, want to go first? Yeah, yeah you know, and I'll, I'll just say that that I think, um, you know, I think to elaborate with what Mitch said is is change management, it, you, you have a, a structure to every project. And, and I always go back to the difference with when you go to a platform implementation, it's a very set standard. You do this, you do this, you do this. It's very linear. The, the steps are really well known. Change management's a little bit different. So you, you come in with a structure, you know where you are, you know what steps you need to take, and you know the, the, the programs that you need to implement. But it, it's, it's a constantly changing and it's constantly shifting to the needs of the client and to the strengths and to the really the comfort level of the client. So while we come into a project like the one we're on now, we, we know, like I would say, I would use the analogy of building a house. We know the steps you need to take to build a house, but you're gonna, going to be working with the client throughout the project to adjust the intricacies of what you're doing 
to meet what their needs are. So it's not just a one size fits all solution. Yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe one of you could talk just real quickly about, um, you know, how we go about ascertaining some of these strengths and weaknesses of a, of a current situation and helping to find the change strategy in, in the form of that organizational readiness assessment. Could one of you maybe just sort of, uh, elaborate on that step in our process a little bit, you know, how do, how do we, how do we get that foundation or that, um, that clear strategy and plan based on that spirit of meeting the client where they are today, but also understanding where they're headed in the future. Could one of you maybe unpack that or just describe at a high level what that organizational readiness assessment is and, and how that fits into what you're, you're talking about here? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that one. There's things that we do in, in an assessment like this is to try and um, bucket observations into themes. Um, and by taking these themes and applying uh, a broad strategy to a theme, we're able to you know, take a, a pretty broad abstract topic and turn it in. Um, when we're talking with our client, we often try to identify things such as resistance, but there's multiple types of resistance. There's you know intentional and unintentional. And you tackle those things differently based on whether or not um, someone is resisting the change because they just don't like the product at all. Oh, they weren't included, or maybe it's unintentional being a detractor, and we need to help to guide them along. And, and it's a change in approach based on you know where each one of those changes falls into those buckets of themes. Yeah, yeah, and and generally we, you know, we we get to those themes or we conclude those those themes based on sort of a two prong change of readiness assessment where we go in and we do online anonymous surveys, but we also do qualitative focus groups. And then during that uh, data gathering, quantitative and qualitative data gathering, we use that input to then analyze to understand what are the nuances of this particular organization compared to others that we work with and what are the pitfalls that this organization is going to face and ultimately what is the most effective change strategy and plan that we can tailor for this particular situation. So I think that you know, that upfront assessment piece really gets to the heart of what you guys are saying, which is so important, which is to sort of frame this or to create a strategy and plan that is not one size fits all, but is more specific to a client's particular situation. That was a discussion with Nate Sroher and Cameron Carpenter from the third stage consulting team talking about a change management case study with one of our global Fortune 100 clients uh, here at third stage consulting. And if you'd like to hear more about that case study and hear the rest of that interview, be sure to go back to episode number 81, or you can check the links below. I've included a link back to that interview, as well as links to every interview we show for you here today or, or sample for you here today. So thank you, Nate and Cameron, for being on the show again, even though you don't know that you're on the show again, because that was back from episode number 81. So we're going to continue the conversation and dive into a really interesting topic. We're going to shift gears a bit, and the next two segments are going to focus on human intelligence and emotional intelligence. So the next interview after this break we're going to take here right now is talking about artificial intelligence versus human intelligence and sort of that intersection and collision of AI and emerging tech along with the human side of change. And then after this next guest, the guest after that is going to be focused exclusively on emotional intelligence and how important that is within organizations going through change. So stick around for that, and we've got a lot more even beyond these next two interviews, of course diving into all the stuff related to change management in this special change management episode number 124 of transformation ground control we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back with more transformation ground control are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation then you need our newly released 2023 digital transformation report this comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, 
Hello, welcome to this very special episode, number 124 of Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host today, and I'm also the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. As I mentioned, this is our very special episode of Change Management. We're doing a deep dive into all things related to change management, playing you the best interviews uh, throughout the last two and a half years of this podcast as it relates to organizational change management. And our next guest here is Noosh Bayat, who is a director of strategy and transformation here at Third Stage Consulting. She's also has a doctorate degree. She's very highly educated. She's ProSci certified. She's been around the block. She's done a ton of stuff related to change management. And she had this idea. She, this was her idea that she brought to me uh, when she first joined our team of why don't, why don't I come on in the show? And actually, I invite, just to back up and to be clear, I invited her to the show and sort of semi-coerced her onto the show. But, and then once she realized she had no choice and I was going to force her to be on the show because I really wanted her on here, uh, she came up with the idea of how about if we talk about AI versus human intelligence and sort of that both the coexistence of technology and AI along with the human side of the things, but also where, where do those two things collide and how do we navigate that in the future? And it's a really fascinating topic. It's an even more fascinating discussion. So we'll play you a little clip from that conversation with Noosh Bayat. And this is back from episode number 121, so not too long ago. Episode number 121 of Transformation Ground Control. We dive into AI versus human intelligence with Noosh Bayat. Let's roll the clip here. Why do you think that this is so important, this whole concept of human intelligence? Why is that so important in today's day and age of advanced technologies and uh, artificial intelligence and all this great stuff that could potentially, in theory, uh, replace or mimic human intelligence? What what makes, why is human intelligence so important or is it important? I guess we could start there. Absolutely. I think it's so critical because from what I understand about our brains, our brains, there's a huge component of our brain that um, supports us in predicting the future. So there's a, um, for us to feel at ease, it's when our brain is able to predict what's going to happen. You know, we wake up and we know that there's coffee in the kitchen, that I'm going to go open my computer and it's going to work well. So there's this predictive capability of our, uh, of our brain that allows us to, to feel comfortable um, surviving and interacting with the world. What, what's, what happens with technology and technological innovation, especially when you bring it within an organization, is that all of a sudden it's not a cognitively stable environment. And with that, I mean, it's very complex. And what that means is that there's no linear causality. There's no way for our brain to fully wrap its hands around this technological innovation. Um, one of the words that I learned when I was in grad school was VUCA, V-U-C-A, which um, was coined by uh, the, the American, uh, our military, once the Cold War was over and we no longer had a singular enemy to focus on. And they said, now our enemy is VUCA, which means conditions that are volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous. So this, this, uh, this kind of conditions, which were, which is uh, uh, our daily realities these days, being able to, you know, we go into a client setting and they bring us a challenge, but there is no singular answer that's going to fix every challenge that they're going to bring up. The level of complexity and the level of intervening factors and unpredictability, even in their organizational setting and culture, it's so much that um, because our brain can't just say, yep, the problem is X, the solution is Y, and our approach is Z. End of conversation. Because we can't do that in, in today's uh, environment of tech, technology and innovation and organizational complexity, what happens is that our brain literally sounds an alarm and feels threatened. So when it can't find that linear causation and find that uh, the, the cause of instability, it 
it raises this alarm. So our fight or flight stress response gets activated. And so often um, people that their cope, their defense mechanisms um, come up, they get guarded, they get stressed, their stress hormones come up. So, um, so that's why um, in these situations, especially in these times of complexity, technical skills aren't going to help us. Because technical skills is when you go into a training environment and they tell you, if you press this, this is going to happen. If you do this, this is going to happen. But in times of complexity, because there is no clear pathway to our solution, and we have all this crazy stress response going on within us, this kind of emotional turmoil, uh, for lack of a better word, What's really required are adaptive skills, skills where you can actually be able to show up to a meeting where everybody's frustrated and they want you to fix it with a magic pill, to be able to take a breath and self-regulate your emotions, be able to, um, to challenge that part of your brain that wants to fix it so fast because our brain loves to do that. It loves to keep uh, going really hard and labeling situations. However, this kind of fix it mentality in complex situations is really, um, is really tough because there is no fix it approach. In these times of complexity, one person can't just come and fix the situation. The person that you paid a lot of money to and hired, they can't just go to their room, come up with a strategy and push it down. There's going to be resistance. There's going to be pushback because the situation is so complex. Um, one of the... Um, the researchers uh, whom I followed a lot at MIT, he called this dynamic complexity where our sense of the problem is unclear, our sense of the solution is unclear, and the people impacted, our sense of the stakeholders is unclear. So he called this uh, dynamic complexity. And again, in these situations, our brains and our emotional state, they're just not happy because they can't just, our brain can't just label it and be done with it. Mm. What's required is these adaptive skills of taking a breath, slowing down, being comfortable in the face of such a complex situation, and being able to bring people together so that you can iterate ideas. So when things speed up, being able to slow down and actually listen and collaborate and not have a fix it approach, but basically um, have an iterative and incremental approach to this issue that you just, your brain wants to fix so badly. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. So that that's a interesting overview of, you know, the human side of change and why it's so difficult. I, I love that was, um, I love that the acronym. What was the acronym again? Was it VUCA? VUCA. And tell us again, it's volatility. Unpredictability, complexity, and ambiguity. So volatility just refers to this, just this crazy pace of change that's going on. Um, unpredictability meaning you know, you, you make your plan and you think it's going to give you one outcome and then it gives you a completely different outcome. Complexity in that there is no clear causality or there's so many cause and effects that you can't just narrow it down to if A, then B. Um, and then um, ambiguity, just the, the, the fog of, you know, whenever we talk about artificial intelligence there's all of a sudden i feel a fog coming on everybody like what exactly is it again right. <laughs> um one of the researchers i love to follow he called these kinds of challenging problems wicked problems as an actual technical term meaning wicked problems don't have a one solution to fix it they're so complex and they're not going anywhere 
and they require you to actually just manage and meet that situation instead of try to fix it because it's not going to be fixed um, and it's not going away. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, well, we'll stay focused and centered on VUCA here today as we, okay. as we go through the conversation and with that in mind. And that's a great way to think about um, why, not only why the human side of change is so important, but also um, why it's difficult. You know, why is it difficult for people to adapt to change? And I think that VUCA acronym really describes that well. And it's a good, a good reminder of some of the complexities that humans face or that we as humans face when we're going through technological change. Uh, what I want to do is just turn to the audience real quickly and look at um, where uh, some people are joining from today. We, we had a few people comment on where they're joining from today. We have Ryan from Denver, uh, Sam from Spain, Laik from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Joel from New Jersey, Peter from Raleigh, North Carolina, um, HA from Cairo, uh, Europe. So there's a, a couple of, of uh, or I'm sorry, not Cairo, Europe, Cairo, Egypt, I should say, um, that HA Hashab is from. Um, so thank you for, for being here today, those of you that have dropped in the chat where you're at today. And if you have questions along the way, anything related to the human intelligence side of change or just organizational change in general, we'd love to hear your, your comments and questions. And I'll, I'll kind of get through my uh, initial questions and we'll turn to the audience as well. Um, so, so I guess as we, as we dive into this then, <coughs> why is, you, you've done a great job of describing just what human intelligence is and what really what some of the complexities of human intelligence are. Um, as it relates to just overall business change, whether it's digital transformation or any sort of transformation for that matter. But in general, why is human intelligence so important? It might be assumed or we, we might be able to um, speculate based on what you've said so far, but what, how would you describe or summarize why it's so important in today's day, day and age of technologies? Absolutely. Well, the more we uh, step into machine machine lear learning and artificial intelligence and all the amazing things that AI is providing us. From what I understand, you know, it's kind of like the garbage in, garbage out that my professor in my first class in computer science told us that, you know, this, this, this is a box. You put garbage in and you're going to get garbage out. And so what I, from what I understand about artificial intelligence, machine learning is that to the extent that we feed it accurate data, to the extent that we validate the learning process of the machine, that's the extent to which we're going to get benefits from artificial intelligence, from machine learning. If we can't bring our full human intelligence to the table, if we can't draw on the institutional knowledge that our people have about their processes, about their industry, about their competition, about the best ways to move forward, if we can't draw on that, if our people are overwhelmed, if they're stressed, if they're in guarded in these defense mechanisms, we're just not going to have accurate validation of any of this data that we're getting our these um, machines to learn. So, if I, I feel like you know, if 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 we're not able to fully tap into our own emotional our own emotional intelligence, human intelligence. Um, and really be able to manage the um, the um, the overthinking that happens, this kind of um, this stress response that comes over us when we're faced with complex situations that literally, in a way, shuts us down. When our stress response is happening, our capabilities to learn, Eric, are really hampered. If we're in this overly stressed, overwhelmed situation, it's really hard for us to learn. It's really hard for us to um, calm down and actually meet the actual, face the situation that we're facing. We're so caught up in the meaning that we're making about the situation instead of actually being able to face it. So again, if we can't bring our full human intelligence to program these machines, to get them to do what we're wanting them to do, um, uh, I would be scared about our future because th these machines, they're, they're just not going to give us what we were hoping that they would provide. 
yeah yeah without that missing secret sauce if you will of, uh, absolutely human side yeah i i don't i think there's just a lot of um mis misinformation out there and there's a lot of confusion in terms of oh my god machines are going to take over as if they're inherently intelligent and they're just going to take us over and i think that feeling of overwhelm that feeling of like oh my god that's the end of life, it gets us to shut down and want to just be in denial and not want to learn what the hell is machine learning? What is artificial intelligence? Because we all can learn about it and we all can make uh, really intelligent decisions in collaboration with our team members. However, I think because of the volume of information out there on the internet, the volume of misinformation, fake information, um, so we get so overwhelmed, our system um, gets so overwhelmed that we'd rather not know or tune out than to actually understand what the challenges are, what the issues are, and how do I develop my team to be able to deal with this? Okay, great stuff. That There's a lot more where that came from, and we go a lot deeper into that conversation. We just played you really just the first segment of that interview with Noosh talking about the uh, artificial intelligence versus human intelligence components of transformation, but there's a lot more to that conversation. So if you go back to episode number 121, or click on the link below. We've included uh, a link that will take you directly to that segment or that full interview on that particular episode of Transformation Ground Control. And you can see where that conversation goes from there. But hopefully that gives you a little taste of what we cover, of what we cover with Noosh as it relates to AI versus human intelligence. So thank you, Noosh, for that great conversation. And we're going to stick to this theme here of the human intelligence piece of it and shift a little bit and focus more on emotional intelligence. We're going to dive into the human intelligence piece, but more specifically talk about emotional intelligence. And this is uh, this next guest is someone who I actually went to high school with. So he grew up in the very, in the same small town that I grew up in, very small town at the time. I think the, t the time uh, we were both there was probably about ten thousand people in this town, um, and we both ended up uh, here closer to Denver, and uh, just coincidentally are sort of floating in the same universe as it relates to organizational change management type stuff. So I'll tell you who that guest is as soon as we take a quick break. But first, we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, this very special episode, number 124, where we're diving into all things related to organizational change management. We're playing you the best interviews that we've ever done so far as it relates to change management. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday. And by the way, every week we cover all things related to digital transformation and change management is something that constantly comes up, uh, so much so that we've half joked about potentially doing a drinking game every time we bring up the word change management in the podcast episode. We're not quite there yet. You're more than welcome to play that game from home if you'd like, but that is something that uh, that shows you how serious we are about change management, the fact that we're talking about potential drinking games as it relates to change management. So kidding aside, though, our next guest I'm really excited for um, to play you this clip. Um, he's someone that's very smart and has just a really unique background because he's not a tech guy. Um, this is probably, I would, if I were to venture to say, he's probably the least technical person in this episode that you're going to hear from. And I think that's a good thing because he doesn't get bogged down in the techno speak and the consultant speak and that sort of thing, but he really understands emotional intelligence. Um, he's a fascinating guy. He's someone I actually went to high school with, um, know him back from my childhood. Coincidentally, we grew up in the same small town 
in the mountains of southern Colorado, which is where Third Stage is based. Third Stage is based in Denver, but about 60 or 70 miles from here is a small little town called Woodland Park, Colorado, and both Jed Hafer and I went to that same high school. And Jed was on the show back in episode number 60. He was actually on the show twice talking about this topic, but I picked number 60 really arbitrarily, to be honest. They're both really good interviews, but this one in particular, I thought, just was was a better representation of the two conversations if I had to pick one. But this is episode number 60, Jed Hafer, who is an emotional intelligence expert, um, and he was on the show talking about emotional intelligence in general and how to navigate emotional intelligence and why it's so important for organizations and leaders that are going through change. So let's roll the clip and we'll come back to the conversation. The big idea here is to turn up our emotional intelligence wherever it's at. We want to turn that dial and turn it up for, for whoever's watching. And I'm going to try to give you the most simple overview of the things that I focus on when I'm trying to help individuals or organizations turn up their emotional intelligence. And uh, the, the big idea that, that we, we start with is that there's a decision ahead of time. Before I even have an interaction, I want to decide ahead of time how I want to be. Um, this is what a lot of successful uh, sports teams do. Uh, my son is a United States Marine. They always go in with a plan, right? And as a matter of fact, they have about four or five different backup plans if, if that plan, something goes awry. Uh, with human beings, sometimes we think we're just going to be there and be reactive and, and sort of hang back and see what happens. The most emotionally intelligent people that I know and the most successful people at having positive interactions with other human beings are the ones who decide ahead of time, this is how I'm going to be. And it might be a good idea to even scribble some thoughts down. How do I want to present to the other human beings that I'm interacting with, however that is? And we'll hear things like, I want to be respectful. No matter what, I want to stay respectful. I want to stay empathetic, particularly if we're going through a crisis. You know, empathy is one of those skills. I'm working for the Love and Logic Institute. Uh, I never thought of empathy as a skill. I thought mm -hmm. it was just something you either feel or you don't feel. But it turns out that conveying of sincere empathy is a really powerful skill, making people feel important and heard and valued. And especially if they're in pain, that we're, we're, well, we're rejoicing when, when they rejoice and we're mourning when they mourn. We're, we're feeling it with them. Uh, and that validation of those feelings, really great thing for uh, especially leaders and, and people who lead teams to be able to do. Uh, too many times when we get our, our feelings hurt, part of the feeling is they didn't consider me. They didn't consider my feelings. So we're considering the other parties, the other party or parties ahead of time before we even start that interaction. And then we move. I say start with self-awareness. That's really not true. We've already started with the decision. The next step is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Me. What's going on with me? Am I hangry today? Am I um, tired? Am I in a bad mood? And I, I always recommend uh, for, for interpersonal relationship stuff, talk to a lot of parents. Uh, let's not have these important discussions when one of us is tired, mm -hmm. hungry, upset about something else. Uh, it's tough for parents because sometimes we don't have as much control over that timing mm -hmm. as we would like. If I'm a boss, hopefully I do. Uh, when am I going to have this, this conversation that might be difficult? I want to make sure that I'm in a good space. I want to make sure that I have my uh, thoughts together. And that I, and if nothing else, I'm not upset about something else. So many times when I deal with an upset person, I realize it's something that happened some other time and in some other place and involves some other person. And that's the, the wrath that I'm getting from this person right now. It doesn't even have a whole lot to do with me. Or at least I like to think that way. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, too, when we talk about that empathy, we learned that in um, our cultural keynote yesterday and from our business process, that we look at across the aisle within business and have that ability to come together in communication to have empathy for, oh, this system is really hard for this person in accounting versus the experience of the person in marketing, because obviously that's my favorite department, as I mm -hmm. said yesterday. But I think that empathy is really, really valuable to understand, especially when implementing a new techni technology and understanding the pain points of business processes. And when we talk about empathy as a skill, we have to make sure that we're uh, sincere there. Mm -hmm. The worst thing in the world is insincere empathy. Uh, when someone says, I know just how you feel. Like, no, you don't. 
Um, it's actually the effort that we take to put ourselves in that other person's shoes. So I know just how you feel is the worst thing to say if I'm trying to convey empathy. Uh, what I might say instead is, is something like, help me understand. Uh, I want to make sure I understand. It's the effort that we take to put ourselves in those, in those shoes. My grandma used to say, uh, before you judge somebody, you should walk a mile in their shoes. Yeah. Because if they're mad at you for judging them, you've got a mile head start on them and you've got their shoes. So <laughs> she was a smart lady. Yeah. She was a smart lady. Uh, next, we would talk about staying interested in that other person. So again, emotionally intelligent people are able to make the other party feel I'm interested in you. And in this, in this age, unfortunately, uh, we make the joke that we're often left to our own devices. Um, you know what kind of devices these. Yeah. The, <laughs> right? So too many times, I'm actually doing the opposite. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'm listening to you. And I'm sending a message that says, I'm not interested in you. Uh, with parents again, and I teach this to teachers and anybody who works with people, uh, to do the exact opposite, to have something that you're focused on. And then when it's time to talk to that person, you actually put that thing away. Uh, I had a boss who did this. This is back in the olden days. My office was just down the hall from her. And she was the basically like the principal of the mm -hmm. school. So when kids came to see her, she'd have her door open. And she would call me when kids were on the way, just so she could hang up on me. Right? She would call my office phone 20 feet away, and as soon as the kids showed up in her doorway, she'd say, oh, a really important conversation I have to have, and she would hang up on me, and she would turn, and she would make that kid feel like the most important person in the world. She was that level of intentional. Of course, it was wow. terrible for my self-esteem, <laughs> but it was great for the kids in terms of making them feel important. Absolutely. And so that's just a little trick. If, if, if people feel like you don't ever listen to them, uh, if you've ever gotten that complaint from a, from a friend or a spouse or coworker, do the opposite of what most people do is you start talking and uh, start looking at my device. Be on the device. That's easy. We all, most of us can do that one. And then put it away and, and physically turn and engage that person so that you're not just interested, but you're showing the interest. And so many times I'm like, well, I can do this. I can multitask. Um, but to how we make that person feel, again, there's an intentionality you're all your audience is used to hearing you say intentionality wins the day. That's a level of intentionality most people don't have. I'm going to have this thing. And, and back in the day with, with my boss, she would be scribbling on something. And if I came to talk to her, she would put it down. She would put it away. And she would physically turn to, to lock her eyes on me. And again, I always felt like the most important person or, or a part of her day. Absolutely. And when we, we talk about this interest, when it comes to digital transformation, we talk a lot about, about that contract, right, between the sponsor and the end user and how we know that user adoption at the end of the day, if your people aren't using that technology, that's affecting things like ROI, that's affecting revenue. And if you are not as a, a leader or a change practitioner interested in their overall experience for software selection for understanding any pain points within this new technology, or even understanding any fear built around new technologies, automation, then if you're not totally interested in that conversation, their value level within the organization really decreases. And that's when we start to see really rippling effects within the overall business infrastructure. Such a good point. And uh, here's another little tip. Never go on and talk about emotional intelligence with someone who's better at it than you. <laughs> That's always uh, embarrassing. If you've ever been, and we were just talking about AI and things, if you've ever been on a, or you've gotten a, a, a hold message mm -hmm. and it's a robot voice saying, your like call Stuart. is important to us, right? <laughs> your call is important to us. And how how important do you actually feel a lot mm -hmm. of times? And again, this some of this hits close to home because I've, I've worked for businesses and we had some kind of a, a message like that. I want to make people feel basically the opposite. Anything that's ever made you feel unimportant, like whether whether you're the end user or not, if it's made you feel like, yeah, we're just rushing over your importance very quickly, we want to do the opposite. And a lot of times it's that extra time, that extra second. If I'm listening to a conversation, it's that extra beat. Instead of quickly chiming in my thoughts that I've been thinking about, I'm going to work this out the first moment of dead air I get <laughs> that extra beat that says I'm really listening I'm really absorbing this stuff and even that could be a very intentional thing um, 
in a meeting or in a conversation or on a Zoom, before I blurt out my answer, I'm gonna take that one extra beat, that one extra second, and then really, um, th there's a thoughtfulness mm -hmm. to my answers rather than just, oh, this is what I was thinking while you were talking. Right, absolutely. And and we talked yesterday about that, that recent video I did that said stop saying automation. Because when you go into you know a manufacturing floor that it you know, employs 50 people and you start saying, I'm gonna automate this, I'm gonna automate that. And the people that that's it, that's their job. That's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're not being intentional as a business leader to say, even though that's gonna be automated, Jed, this is the A, B, and C, D role you're going to move into and the opportunity to expand your value within the business. Yeah, we don't wanna speed right past mm -hmm. the, the, the person aspect and, and how we make those people feel. Uh, it's, it's a perfect example of, yeah, if, I, if I'm around people and I'm talking about all the systems that are going to do all the things that we need mm -hmm. done, and I completely pass right by the, the people aspect, how are those people going to feel? Even if, and many times it's pretty exciting. I mean, I've worked with companies where they worry, oh, I'm going to lose my job because I don't know how to do this thing, and now they have technology that's going to do mm -hmm. this thing. And it turns out, no, they have a new role, exactly. and they love yeah. it. And it's so much more uh, stress-free, or maybe not stress-free, but it's less stress. And it, it, all that anxiety, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about, I have some thoughts on anxiety, especially when we're going through change. All that anxiety was unwarranted, but if I'm the person delivering the message, whether I'm a leader or not, if I'm delivering a message, I wanna be cognizant of how I'm making the other person feel, because we remember how things make us feel. Right. We remember how people oh, absolutely. make us feel. There's restaurants with really good food that I won't go back to because of how they made me feel. There's also places with average coffee that I can't wait to go to because of how they make me feel like the most important uh, customer they've ever had. So that was a clip or a partial part of the conversation that we had with Jed Hafer talking about emotional intelligence within digital transformation and change in general. Uh, that's back from episode number 60. So if you'd like to hear the full interview with Jed, which I highly recommend you do check it out. Go back to episode number 60 of this show. I've included a link in the show notes below or the description field for this podcast episode. That link will take you directly to the full conversation with Jed, which is about an hour long, maybe a little less. Um, so you can click that link or go to episode number 60 to hear the entire interview. So thank you, Jed, for such a great and engaging conversation. Really, really nice guy, too, by the way. It was good to have him on the show. It's sort of a, a blast from my past uh, personally, too. So we're going to keep this change management thread rolling through the remainder of this episode. We've got, I think, uh, what, four guests left, or, or four segments left that we're going to play you. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the human adoption of newer technologies, emerging technologies in general. And this is a guest that has been on the show once, back in episode number 27, and she will actually be on the show again in July of 2023, I believe it is. So here in the next few weeks, she is going to be back on the show, so be sure to stick around uh, to see her again. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and play you this clip back from episode number 27, where she's on the show talking about human adoption of new and emerging technologies. So stick around. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? I'll give you energy. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, this very special episode of Transformation Ground Control. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation including the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of change. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday, streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And then we also have the audio-only version that goes to all the audio podcast platforms like Google, Amazon, Apple Podcast, etc. So wherever you listen or watch podcast, listen to or watch podcast, 
I encourage you to check it out. Be sure to subscribe to this show. It's called Transformation Ground Control. And this is the very special episode where we're diving into all things related to organizational change management and playing you the best of our change management discussions over the last two and a half years of hosting this podcast. And our next guest is actually, this is the guest where we're reaching back the furthest. Uh, this is back from episode number 27, uh, which is hard to believe it's already been that long. We're on episode number 124 now. This is going back to number 27. Emma Roloff, who's an industry expert uh, in the tech space, more specifically related to organizational change management. Um, she's a very interesting person, has a very interesting style to her, very knowledgeable of change management. Uh, you can follow her on TikTok. She's got a great uh, TikTok following. Um, you can find her there. I think her her uh, username is Digital Transformation Princess, or it might just be Transformation Princess. I don't recall which one, but search Emma Roloff, E-M-A-R-O-L-O-F-F. You'll find her there. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and play you this clip where she was on the show talking about the human adoption of new and emerging technologies, which similar to the last conversation or two conversations ago in this episode where we had Noosh Bayad on the show, Noosh was talking about AI versus human intelligence. This is a similar kind of a conversation where we're focused on how do we get human adoption of newer and emerging and potentially more threatening technologies or perceived threatening technologies. So let's roll this clip here with Emma Roloff talking about human adoption of new technologies. When you automate someone's job, how do you manage that change? I mean, because that's a pretty significant change to come in and say, we're going to have a robot or RPA automate what you might be spending, you know, 50, 60% of your time doing. What, what have you seen work or what have you seen some of the challenges be from a, from a change management or human perspective of that? So I think the biggest, and I, I, I don't want to say this is a misconception because it is a change and you do have to manage that change. Um, but I think what typically happens and what I've seen with our customers is more often than not, they are welcoming of that portion of their job being taken because it's not that they don't have enough other things to be doing. It's that the other things don't get the attention that they should be, or they don't have the capacity to ever take a deep breath. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's been organizations that we go in to help specifically in this accounts payable scenario that you mentioned, that we're going in with whether it's RPA or some of the other tools that we can get into that we've got that kind of help eliminate some of this manual work. And we go in and we help them automate portions of that process to eliminate the manual keying that they need to do. And it opens up time for them to suddenly be paying their bills on time as an organization. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, they've had a three month backlog of processing that they're trying to get through and they can't hire and train people quick enough or they don't have the budget to have those people there. And so rather most of the time when we come in, unless it's a very, very, very large uh, organization that has a lot of people only ever touching these repetitive tasks, do we get into the place where we're displacing people's positions? We're really just refocusing their time to focus on what are the really impactful parts of their job that drive the business forward. And usually once you kind of put it in that frame of mind, they're welcoming of that change because they don't want to be doing that part of their job anyhow. And so it's, I mean, and again, I don't, I don't do, do not want to mislead that there isn't you know, some positions that might be um, eliminated because of intelligent automation and some of the, the tools that we're going to talk about today. But more often than not, the organizations are raring and ready to go to take that person and train them to do something different if their whole position was something that's being eliminated or they're shifting their focus onto that higher value task. Um, but it does, you have to have the conversation honestly. Yeah. on the front end for them to get to the point where they understand that and they're not fearful of the change or fighting the change. Because if they think that their job is going to go away, they're not going to help you do it. But if they understand we're not here to eliminate your job, we're here to make it better. And let's talk about what your your ideal better job looks like and you be a part of this. They will come up with new ideas to manage the process. They'll help bring forward other, you know, bottlenecks within the process that you should be focusing on as well. And it'll be just a, so much more collaborative throughout the entire process. Yeah. So again, their engagement and buy-in early on rather than defining the change and forcing the change on them is sort of the, 
Yeah, and one of the things I mentioned that, you know, from our perspective, our methodology, we have typically a blended approach of bringing in a process consultant and or using data to help us hone in on where those opportunities are for improvement. But I think that that process consultant and even, you know, whether it's someone internally or a third party, but somebody being there to help you have those conversations and ask questions in the right way and frame things in the right way and not forget about the people is such a critical part of that because, you know, as you get into conversations about change, it's a scary thing for people. And you know that, I mean, we're both human centric change people. Um, and when you can help them feel even incrementally more comfortable with it and help them feel ownership of it. One of the main things that we do is a discovery process where our team is working alongside with our customers team to design what that future state looks like. And when it's somebody from the outside asking questions of why do you do it that way? Or is there a different way to do this? It's less threatening to answer those questions and you don't get the, the same defensive nature that you do if you're managing it internally. And I don't know if you guys have had that experience, but sometimes that like friendly third party asking the question is a lot more well received than somebody, um, even if they have good intentions within your organization. Yeah, it's, you're not, you're not caught up people know that you're not caught up in the politics, you know, the internal dynamics and, you know, we're not, you're not jockeying as an outside party. You're not jockeying for any sort of, there's no ulterior motive to suggest something like that, but it could be perceived that way. If it's someone internally suggesting like, Hey, what is Emma, what do you do all day? Like, you know, do we, do, we really, do you really need to be doing that? Maybe we should just automate your job. That's going to be a lot more threatening if I say it to you as, an, as a coworker versus a consultant comes in and maybe more tactfully asks the same, the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of it that way, and, it, and it's interesting to hear you say that because uh, we see a lot of organizations that um, that don't even think about like what what are we going to do with that time that we save? You know, they and that is something I think from an org design perspective you have to do is say, okay, if I'm saving thirty or forty percent of Emma's time and she doesn't have to process POs anymore, what is she going to do? What's her focus? How does it? How does she reprioritize her work um, in the unfortunate event that her job is going to go away? what does that look like? What do you do with Emma? You know, and, and just having those answers is important. And, and companies don't think about that a lot of times because they're so focused on the technology. Like, how do we get this technology to work and how do we define the process? But they don't always think about what is that impact to the organization? Yeah. And I, again, we've had some, and I would say more early, early adoption of digital transformation when there used to be mail rooms with, you know, 20 people that were working in these large organizations. That was when I, I think we saw a little bit more of like, a, okay, so what does our training path look like for these people or where well, where else in the organization can we find a spot? And it was a little bit more purposeful. I would say it's been a while since there hasn't been enough work to keep people busy after we've automated portions of their job. Um, that like, it isn't like, a, we just, you know, more, they've brought in automation because they have a capacity issue as of, or they are growing so rapidly and they would rather not have to hire at the clip that's required to support that growth. And so then they're able to keep the same size team, but you know, the, the company growth would have outpaced the size of their team had they not automated the process. Right. I've got one customer who I think if I'm going to say this correctly, they have a process that they put in place probably 10 years ago. Um, and so they were early adopters of, of technology and using it to manage processes. But over the course of that time frame, they have offset an additional headcount of 130 people from how they were doing the process to what they're doing today and incremental improvements to that process over time has allowed them. So it's not a hard ROI because they didn't hire those 130 people, but based off of their project projections, they were able to offset that much additional headcount. Yeah. 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 It seems like in more recent years, uh, companies are a lot more lean, you know, they don't have a lot of, a lot of uh, fat to, to trim, you know, in terms of uh, the people I know in the nineties, when I, started my career, there was a lot more, it felt like there's a lot more trimming that had still had to happen in terms of, of headcount and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so keeping in this initial theme of, you know, sort of alternate emerging technologies that not everyone is, is fully aware of yet. Um, 
you mentioned the word intelligent automation a second ago. <laughs> tell us, tell us that. What what is intelligent automation? How does it apply to an organization? Yeah. So um, I I got and dropped that. And one of my big pet peeves is within our industry. I mean, at least an ERP has been an ERP for a while now. In our industry, it seems like every two years or so, we like to throw another term at everybody just to confuse them. And so <laughs> intelligent automation, I don't want to say is a completely separate idea from something like RPA. But really when we take a look at intelligent automation is we're looking at tools like artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, natural language processing, these more kind of advanced emerge, they're, they're still emerging because they're not kind of at the point where we think of AI as these, you know, all knowing, uh, I think it was Will Smith in the, the iRobot movie. Yeah, it was. You know, like we think when we think of artificial intelligence, we think of like these all-knowing, like crazy smart robots that are going to take over the world. We're not to that point yet. So if we're if that's our goal, we're still emerging. Um, but it's bringing in those um, human-like thought patterns, and you know, AI in itself has so many different layers of then kind of subsequent technologies that build up to that larger category. But it's taking that kind of hum human mimicked intelligence and bringing it into these automation tools that have been around for a while. So things like RPA being combi combined with those tools would then become intelligent and kind of that intelligent automation space. Um, another kind of category within this, and I mentioned that this kind of falls into our capabilities as well. There's a technology called OCR, which I'm sure being in the ERP world, you're familiar with OCR, but that's optical character recognition. In the past, that, that technology has been around for, for many, many years, far before I got into the industry. It was very template based and it was very much being able to look at a specific portion of a document based on coordinates or based on a, you know, a, a a actual template that you built out in your tool to go to this spot and capture the characters that were at that spot within the document. Now we're able to do things like intelligent document processing where we have AI and, and machine learning as a part of these solutions. So rather than having to build out templates, the tools can kind of look at the document the same way that a human would and use context on the document and use things like natural language processing to know that the pound sign or the hashtag or whatever we want to call it also means number. And it knows that that means number and it knows that we may, through that natural language processing, we may abbreviate the word number down to NUM. And so when it sees, you know, and or, or I'm sorry, or um, invoice, it sees invoice and, you know, it has the invoice number and it's an abbreviation or it's a pound sign or however that that vendor presents that information to you, the tool is intelligent enough now to understand that that's what that means, understand the context of that, and then know that it should look above that, it should look below that, it should look next to it. And then it's going to determine, oh, okay, that's the invoice number. I'm going to grab that value and I'm going to pull that out as an index value. And that typically has had to be either a manual process or we had to build out those manual templates to be able to get us to that point. Now these tools, you know, are so well trained and so well versed in what an invoice looks like. You can have all sorts of variability still with very high confidence coming through because of that intelligent aspect being added into the tools. And what we're starting to see much more is now that intelligence being built into all sorts of technology that allows us to kind of move into that intelligent automation space beyond just capture or beyond robotic process automation to things like business process management or BPM tools now starting to have intelligence infused in them. So it can start to do some routing with a little bit more logic and a little bit more thought process and intelligence behind it instead of all just yes or no, right or wrong, you know, kind of logic that we've used in the past and starting to minimize the amount of human intervention that you need in these processes when things follow your, your standard process. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And I can see a lot of uses for that. I mean, there's so many, you think about the average organization, a, a big, huge company that does lots of different things, lots of different documents floating around with different nomenclature. And even just that one example of invoice number, you know, think of all the alternate 
uh, scenarios where that would help, you know, even outside of invoice processing as well. Well, and some of those, again, with, with machine learning and that type of thing, I call, you know, I talk about that, that tool specifically a little bit of an art and a little bit of a science right now, because when it's got machine learning in it or any of these tools that do, they get more effective over time too. So as you get more documents running through the process and the engine has more time to learn from these document samples, you will have to intervene and kind of verify through the process less and less as it goes. And so it will know, oh, okay, even though I see this address block and I know this address block is this vendor, and I know this vendor typically puts this information there and, oh, okay, we're processed. We know we can, with confidence that we've got it. And it can do things too, like, you know, on the invoice side, I'm going to calculate all the line items and add in the tax and make sure that this, you know, that the number I've captured here matches and, and is verified based on the math that I've done. And so it can do some of that stuff that we had to rely on people to do even three years ago, you know? So there's um, there's a lot of advancements being done in all of these kind of automation or process management tools to get to that point where we have less and less intervention needed each step of the way. So that was a clip from our conversation with Emma Roloff back in episode number 27 of Transformation Ground Control. We delve into, in that conversation, the human adoption of new and emerging technologies. I played you just a, a small clip from that interview you can watch the full interview by going back to episode number 27 of this show, or just click on the link below. There's links to each of the speakers that we're featuring here today. Click on the link that talks about or refers to Emma Roloff. That'll take you to the full hour long interview that we had with Emma uh, back in 2021. So thank you for being on the show. And again, if you like Emma, she will be back on the show here later this summer. Um, so we have her scheduled, I believe, for either late July or early August. I just don't recall when, but it's coming up soon. So be sure to stick around. And speaking of sticking around, don't go anywhere yet because we still have three more guests for you. And these are three very good guests. We're going to talk about change resistance next. And we're going to bring in this guest or play you this clip from a guest that joined us from Australia. And uh, she was on episode number 105 talking about how to overcome change resistance. So let's take a quick break and we'll play you a clip from that guest and we'll also tell you who it is. Uh, but first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Just tell me what you've done. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control in this very special change management episode, number 124, where we're diving into the best change management discussions and interviews of this podcast so far. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm your host. I'm also the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And our next guest is an exciting one. This is someone who was on our show on episode number 105, and it's Friska Wiras, who... who I'm sorry, Frisco Weira, who is from Australia. She's a change expert. She's a speaker in the change management world. And she's got a very interesting style to her as far as her Instagram videos. So if you follow, or if you're on Instagram, you can follow her there. Um, and her company name or her brand name is Fresh by Frisca. So if you go to Fresh by Frisca, and that's spelled F-R-I-S-K-A.com, you can learn more about, about uh, Frisca. But she was on the show back in episode number 105 talking about how to overcome change resistance. And we all want to know how to overcome change resistance and understand why people resist change, especially as it relates to the more subtle versions of resistance to change, because that's oftentimes the hardest to detect and the hardest to overcome as a result. 
So with that all being said, let's roll you this clip of where we interviewed Friska talking about overcoming change resistance. Well, one of the, the things that I recognize or noticed in, in your thought leadership as I've gotten to know you over recent months is that you talk a lot about shifting re change resistance into mm. resistance. And I know there's a lot of talk about change resistance. That's certainly a, a big thing. I think most yeah. of us recognize that there is change resistance. But what does that mean when you talk about shifting from resistance into resilience? What does it mean or what are some of the strategies that you've seen work to mm. make that transition? First of all, let's take the literal definition of resistance. So that is the failure to accept or comply with something. And if we think of, for example, the French resistance, it was a secret organization resisting change, resisting authority usually. So this happens in organizations day in, day out when they try to introduce and implement a change to the way that they operate. So people either, they either opt out, they clock out, or they check out completely if it's not managed. So instead of the French resistance in change and transformation, people resist in a different way. They either covertly or overtly undermine and sabotage transformation efforts, right? Billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of hours are wasted every single year because change initiatives fail. So this is often, you know, you'll see it, you know, every day, uh, disengaged people, non-existent buy-in, leadership that are either invisible or don't really own their role in sponsoring and leading a change. You then see what I call these glacial evolutions that masquerade as digital transformation, simply because businesses either don't want to or they can't transform that natural resistance. So resistance isn't a bad thing, it's completely natural, but they can't seem to transform it into something more productive. And that something is resilience. And for me, resilience is defined as the capacity to withstand or recover from difficulties, from bumps in the road. So it's the ability of some something or someone in this situation, organizations, to spring back into shape. So to spring back from change so they are faster, stronger, and better than they were before. That's well said. And I, I love that concept because I think so often change management is viewed and used as a more of a defensive mechanism. Mm -hmm. Like how do we how do we prevent people from sabotaging the project? And it's not focused on taking it one step further, which is not only uh, overcoming intentional resistance and unintentional resistance, but also translating it into something better than it was before, than the organization was before, as, as you put it. Yeah, like Im imagine when a change is introduced that instead of being met with contempt, it's met with curiosity because, and people exert their resilience instead of dig their heels in with resistance. So that's in the ideal world. Organizations will spring get back into shape and regain, if not improve, their productivity and um, profitability. And in my experience, the most effective um, strategies is really early, early, early engagement, early involvement, participation, buy-in, and education. So all too often, um, change experts are brought in as a last resort when things have gone pear-shaped. It's like a, it's like an afterthought when really they should they should be in the main body, not the appendix. Right. And what about, um, what do you say to organizations that might say that our people this all sounds great, Friska, but our people are not, this isn't going to be a problem. Our people are, are on board. They're not going to sabotage. You, you talked about sabotage a moment ago. We've got good people. They want what's best for the organization and they're not going to sabotage the organization. And I really don't think change is going to be that hard because these new tools we, we're introducing, these new business processes are so much more effective. Everyone recognizes the need for it. So yeah, it sounds good, but you know, really change. Yeah, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge generalization. Anytime an organization says, everyone does this, or they've always done that. I really take that with a pinch of salt. But, and it doesn't, you don't need, you know, 90% of people to resist in order for changes to flop. It actually just takes two to three key stakeholders who are quite influential in the business to manifest that resistance and that'll spread like wildfire. So, and this is also the challenge, right? People don't buy prevention, they buy the cure and the cure is a lot more expensive than prevention. I always say to my clients that you can spend a reasonable amount of time educating and engaging people about your change effort or a really unreasonable amount of time battling resistance all the way to the bitter end. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's well put that not everyone, it's dangerous to generalize everyone within an organization or even across organizations as well. 
if there is one generalization to be made, I'd say that it's there is going to be some level of resistance to change. It's just a matter of how severe it is, what the root cause of it is, and mm. what to do to, to overcome it. Yeah, and, and often when people make those blanket coverall statements, they're really opinions. There has not been any rigorous data collation or surveying or observational feedback that's been gleaned. So that's also something dangerous, just relying on your own perspective. Uh, but here's a here's a question I wanted to get to just while we're diving into this whole topic of change management. Um, this is from Sid over on YouTube. He asks, mm -hmm. from from an organizational structure perspective, what department within an institution does the organizational change function tend to reside, or where or where should it reside? Mm. Um, it depends on the objective of the change management function and what the type of change is. So, for example, in my experience, the most um, effective, it's like real estate, right? Location, 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 location matters. If it's in comms, it's in a, if it's in HR, I'm sorry, but it's dead because they don't have a great reputation and often they're the biggest um, resistors of changes. So when my changes have been received really well, they're either in um, operations, the CRO's tent or the CFO. So someone with gravitas, someone with the Perth strings, um, someone that's got a good reputation. So usually operations and definitely related to, to performance because you want to underscore the message that change management is not, it's not a nice to have, it's it's a must have. And we've all seen many examples of organizational initiatives in the corporate graveyard. Some of the most expensive blunders, you know, Daimler bands, uh, Blockbuster, et cetera, it's all change management failures. Right. And, you know, it's really interesting that you said that I, I don't know that I've heard anyone say this out loud was the part you said about HR and, and comms. If, if you put it yeah. in, HR and everybody comms, always says that no one said it out loud. Yeah, but everybody's thinking that <laughs> I've just got the guts to say it out loud. <laughs> right. But that's, you know, that's the natural inclination for a lot of a lot of my mm. clients and, and yours, too, it sounds like is let's let's put it in HR because that's the people talent management side of things. And so. Intuitively, it sort of makes sense why you'd want to put it in HR. But what you're saying is there's not enough pull and credibility within HR in order for change management to get the recognition and attention it deserves. Yes. Is that I mean, intuitively, yes, it makes sense because it's all it's all about people. But most HR departments, and yes, I'm making a generalization, so don't send me hate mail, people. HR functions are generally concerned with compliance, right? Checking the box, et cetera. They can, that, that's what they're there for, you know, doing the dotting the I's and crossing the T's. They're not really interested in driving performance, driving innovation, you know, brutal execution and efficiency. So those sort of things usually happen in operations. So my background is mining, engineering, um, and oil and gas, and that's where the change management has, has resided. Right. Yeah. And especially in a operation heavy or mm. intensive industry like you just mentioned mining engineering etc yeah. it seems like it's even more important that you have that yeah and, and and if it is a culture change if it's a culture change effort then it should be the ceo because the buck stops with them it shouldn't be in hr it should be whoever's at the very top they should be sponsoring it not that not the head of hr right now how about this here's here's a question actually i have the same question by two people asked slightly differently uh one is from william on YouTube. And he says, what are good early preemptive steps to take for mitigating resistance from leadership? And then part two of this, let me just sort of dovetail on that a little bit uh, with another question from Sam Graham on LinkedIn. And he says, can change be successful if the C-suite is not seen to be changed first? So I guess maybe just to break that up a little bit, let's start at the top. You know, everything you just said sounds great, but what if leadership themselves are part of the problem? And if so, if they are the problem, then what do you do to, to mitigate that resistance mm. leadership level? Yeah, this is a challenge, especially the middle layer of management. I call them the permafrost layer because often we expect them to lead their own teams and their own people through change when they themselves haven't gone through the change process. So they themselves are trying to make sense and they're, they're, they're doing a bit of soul searching, a bit of meaning making. What does this change mean to me, etc.? So the first steps when leaders aren't on board with change is to really understand what is the source of their hesitation. And in my experience, if people re are resisting change, it's because they're scared of something. They're scared of loss, scared of losing something, and we are more motivated to act by loss than gains. So it's either power, prestige, protection, pay, or performance. 
So if it's if it's pay, they may be concerned that, I don't know, their bonuses are at stake or they're not going to meet their SDIs. Um, so I've seen this time and time again when, when a new performance management system is rolled out and they're like, oh, there goes my A, B, and C. Um, prestige is about, you know, maybe they're losing their corner office. Maybe they're losing some perks. So the, the prestige of their role is losing its luster. Um, performance. This change could mean it's very challenging for them to maintain a high level of performance and thus look good in their job, right? We, we don't know. Um, protection. So this particular leader could be protected, sheltered somehow, which kind of hides their underperformance. And this change, such a restructure, could take the lid off that. So we don't know which of these pieces driving their, their resistance and their sense of loss if we don't, A, talk to them about it. And if we don't have that relationship with them, we need to cast our net wider and find out who does. Because, you know, for example, new client, me sitting down with the CEO saying, so why are you resisting? It's not going to work. Like you can't adopt a, an abrupt frontal effort like that. You need to be a bit more subtle, a bit more delicate and a bit more tactful. But the answer will not come overnight. So it takes, and, and it comes from all sources. It could be, you know, observing them. It could be asking different people in the organization. But really what will help a lot is if you practice a great deal of empathy. So what is it that they're concerned about, right? Walk a mile in their shoes and see things from their perspective to get the answer. Right, right. And so just, you've said it a couple times now, but I think it's super important, those five Ps. Can you just repeat it one more time? The For, power uh, pay, protection, prestige, performance, and power. That's great. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's I, I love that framing. Is that something you developed? I'm just something curious. I developed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From that, from many years of experience, it's always one of those P's. <laughs> I, the five P model by Frisco. You heard it here first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's great. Um, and then just building on that, this is from from Kyler on LinkedIn. She asked, building on that comment that you just had or that thread about leadership. What is the responsibility of leadership to combat and address resistance? Now, assuming they're on board, that you know we're not necessarily um, addressing resistance to change at the leadership level, although it's, mm -hmm. it's more common than, than many may think. Um, mm -hmm. What is it that? What is their role, and, and how should they be involved in, in addressing resistance to change? They need to be hands on. Like the change management professionals, like you and I, we can provide the conditions for adoption to thrive. We can provide advice. We can say, hey, this person may be upset because of A, B, C, but it's up to the leaders to actually have those hard conversations with people and understand what's driving their resistance and use their own relationships, their networks, their gravitas, their pool to drive adoption and buy in for this change. Because at the end of the day, that's the leader's role. And this is where I see a lot of organizations kind of fall by the wayside. The leaders tend to subcontract or defer their resistance management responsibilities to their, their 2IC or the, or the consultants uh, such as myself. Well, it's not the consultant's role, it's the leader's role. I mean, that's why they make the big bucks. They are the leader. They're expected to advocate for the change, sponsor the change upwards, build a coalition horizontally of support and manage resistance actively. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Makes total sense. I, I feel like we um, missed that question by that gentleman that asked, will change still be successful if leaders aren't on board? I would say no. And if there is success, it's very short term. So when I first enter a client organization, always, always, always start at the top. So understand where they sit in the change commitment curve. And if they are resistant, find out why. Right. Yeah, that's great. Great point of clarification. Okay, that was a partial clip of our interview with Friska talking about overcoming change resistance. That's back from episode number 105 of this podcast. So if you want to hear the entire interview in more detail, go back to episode number 105 or look at the links below in, this, in, in the notes for this episode. We've included a link that will take you directly to that full interview in the podcast episode number 105. So we've got uh, one more guest to go here. Um, last but not least, we're going to dive into something that's a little bit more granular within the world of organizational change management, and that is training and adoption. So software training, user training, user adoption, employee training and adoption, all that stuff. What are the things we need to know as we create a training plan for our 
team and for our internal employees as it relates to our digital transformation and ERP initiative. So we want to have these two guests on, or we did have these two guests on back in episode number 119, where we talked about that very topic. So we're going to play you that clip as soon as we come back from a quick break. But first, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you or in the links below for this particular podcast episode. You can find a link to uh, take you to the page that will allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the Guide to Organizational Change Management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 124. This is a very special episode focused on organizational change management. We've played you about a dozen clips so far. This will be about a dozen after we're done here, uh, after this next interview. But about a dozen clips of the best of interviews and discussions that we've had as it relates to change management on this podcast, which, by the way, this podcast covers everything related to digital transformation, starting with the people, process, technology, and strategy aspects of transformation. And change management is something we inevitably cover on each and every episode. But here today, we wanted to pull out the interviews that are most relevant and go the deepest into organizational change. So this final interview, last but not least, this is where we're getting into some of the uh, the more granular aspects of change management, in particular, the training and adoption. So this is where the rubber meets the road. We've worked through resistance to change. We've done our organizational assessments. We've understood what the different tools are that we need to, to pave the way for change. And one of the later but really important work streams that happens is typically the training and adoption pieces. So now that we've built the software, we've paved the way for some of the organizational change resistance that might have been blocking us from making progress, now we can get to the training and adoption piece, which usually comes later in a digital transformation. And in this interview, we thought we'd have Joanne and Nikki from a company called Optimum, which is a, a training consulting company based out of the UK. And their sister company called Onboard ERP. You can go to onboarderp.com to learn more about them. But we had Joanne and Nikki from these two sister companies on to talk about best practices in end user training and adoption. So let's roll the clip. What about limitations of generic, off the shelf, out of the box training materials? I mean, most of these vendors like S4 HANA, you mentioned before, Microsoft Dynamics, they've been around for years and they've had time to build up some a pretty good library of standard training materials. What are the limitations? I think this is a really important point because so many organizations, including a lot of our clients, just don't understand or don't fully recognize the fairly severe limitations of that standard off the shelf or out of the box training material or training content. How, what are the limitations of that? Or maybe give us some examples yeah. there. Sure. Um, yeah, there are considerable limitations and you are right. Some of the um, well-established software houses do have off-the-shelf training material, but there are limitations, and some of those are, they are typically functional in content and instruction. So what that means is it cannot address any of the business-specific or business um, context messages to all audiences. It's impossible, right? Because you've got multiple sectors and multiple industries reading and referring to the same content. So it cannot be that specific to that audience. So that leaves the audience a tad disengaged and also asking the question, is this pertinent to me? Is this right for me? For example, if I'm looking at content that shows me how to raise a purchase order uh, to order steel from China, yet I'm in retail or pharma, that's not really going to help me that much. It's, you know, it's going to leave me confused. I need to understand and see and read language that pertinent to my business, my product, my customers, my suppliers, etc. Um, so illustrations and examples, they're all generic. And a 
significant percentage of a learner's understanding is, is not just by reading explanatory uh, content, it's by looking at screen illustrations. Those screen illustrations, which a lot of our um, online tools do, so Task Recorder, Click Learn, all of those types of automated online tools that are typically sold as the answer to everybody's training problem, reduce your cost by 70%, no additional external cost, they actually take screenshots of empty dialogue boxes. Now, surely you would want a value, a meaningful value or text description or business aligned content, because that's also going to contribute to our learners understanding as to how they would populate those screens. So I suppose I would say that the, the key word for me is it's not business process aligned. Um, it's very generic and it doesn't actually address the bespoke requirements. And more and more now we're actually coming across organizations who unfortunately have spent their training budget or managed their training budget based on the cost of one of these system line tools. So for example, we've come across um, Oracle Guided Learning recently, but also with Task Guides and Enable Now. And it really is sold as being the answer to everything. But we've discovered, for example, with Oracle Guided Learning recently, one of our clients needed seven languages translated. Um, but they've come back and been told that they can probably get French translated and it's 80 percent accurate. Now, for a client that's actually investing, you know, put a lot of their, their training budget and their, their trust in a tool like that, it needs to give them more than that. And as Eric quite rightly said, we've got a lot of these big software houses. So Oracle for Oracle Fusion and S4 HANA and so on. They have libraries worth of generic content. But again, some of these online solutions are literally they sell role-based training, but that role-based training is basically a whole combination of lots of different process guides that that poor end user who may, I'm not going to say as 400, show my age there, but maybe moving from a completely different environment and just reading content on screen, that's not going to cut it. They need a blended approach. They need maybe just that first, get them across that first hurdle and then they can start self-learning um, tools. But it's really, really important that you understand, I would say, that you know what you're buying and you know what you're getting if you are investing in any type of automated learning program. Do your research, do your homework. Yeah, great point. And and you know another thing you've you've alluded to in that response, Nikki, is the fact that um, so many of these ERP systems are are fairly flexible and they can do a lot of different things. And even the simplest workflow, like accounts payable, you mentioned. There isn't really a standard accounts payable process that every organization is using, even for the same product. I mean, even for the same product, you're going to have variations of how that system was configured and, and also how you're going to not only interact with the system, but what are the things that happen outside the technology? Like, what are the things that don't relate to that one technology? So often we get myopically focused on S4 HANA, Microsoft D365 or whatever the tool is that we don't think about, well, what do you do outside the system? Or what other systems are you touching? Do you need to touch to be yeah. able to do your job? And yeah. I imagine that's part of the training approach too that you would suggest. Yeah, it's such a valid point, Eric, because um, a lot of um, clients that we work with or, or deal with initially, they'll ask, oh, so you'll only train us in um, Dynamics 365 or just S4 HANA? No, we're, we train in end user solutions. So if our end user touches D365 um, extensions and an external pricing um, or yeah, pricing tool, all of those need to be addressed as part of that end user experience. Otherwise, we're not giving them their true role and how it will be used with that system. So, and that's the difference, I suppose, with um, SI training. It's very much, unless you're starting to look at integrations, it's very much under the bonnet looking at that ERP functionality and its modules. For us, we're looking at what holistically that end user needs and also not what they don't need. In other words, we've probably all been on courses at some stage in our lives where we've just been doing this. You know, counting the clouds because the content that's being trained out at that present moment in time is not relevant and then we miss a bit that is. So the idea behind that bespoke training is it's all got to be relevant for the end user and it will encompass any of those third party tools that you mentioned, Eric. Right. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Just to turn to the audience here, some of the audience comments and question. Um, like on LinkedIn says, I'd, I'd speak about S4 HANA. It's true that most material is available for functional people but it lacks off the shelf material for business users, 100% correct. Yeah, so, great. you know, and it's, it, we have a client, actually we have one client that we're working with right now. They're actually implementing S4 HANA. They're about to go live here in, in a couple months and they they have been um, 
asking us like, why, why is it you have to custom create these trading materials? These, this software has been around for years. I mean, there's tons of material available and that's, that's, I think the, you know, the disconnect oftentimes is the understanding of, yeah, there's a lot of, to your point, Nikki, there's a lot of materials available, but they're not specific to your business and you're deploying S4 HANA in a very different way than any other organization has. Um, even though they're not doing a ton of customization, it's still tailored. It's, yeah. it's configured differently. They use different third-party systems that bolt onto it. All that stuff, you know, you've got to work through. And those little things aren't so little, you know, when you, when it comes to adoption and training and back to the original point of why products fail because of this, it's those little things that I don't know how to do in my job that creates sort of a domino breakdown in, our, in the end-to-end -end processes because I don't know how to do one part of the process. No one taught me how to do it or I just don't understand it well. And that ends up leading to a bunch of process breakdowns that can become yeah. pretty material. Yeah, and also in client meetings, the, the dreaded words we hear are, um, oh, it's just off the shelf, or it's just box. out of the box <laughs> functionality. And until they say that, well, the whole world's not using the same chart of accounts for starters. And then there's a whole melee of different areas, even if it is out of the box with very limited customization, it's still the ERP system used by you, your customers, your suppliers, your product suite, your materials. So it, it still does need to have that bespoke element with regards to training because an off the shelf um, set of training materials doesn't cut it for most ERP implementations. Yeah, and I would I would argue too that the more business value you're trying to get out of your digital transformation or ERP implementation, the more important that employee adoption training is. Because let's just use an example of a multinational organization that's deploying Microsoft D365, and they're using that as an opportunity to standardize business processes and sort of consolidate functions in different locations and move to a shared service model where now you've got consolidated HR, consolidated accounting and finance or whatever. Um, that's that's not just a software deployment. That's a material business transformation. There you're talking about changing people's jobs and how you operate. And so the, how do you build that sort of non-technology, but more process and organizational focus into training materials? Have you found that to be an important part of that customization of training? Yeah, it's absolutely critical. And one of the questions we typically ask quite early on is, does your, is it an ERP implementation? Or as you said, is it a business transformation program? Do you have a target operating model exercise ongoing? Does it finish before or after your implementation? Ideally before. But the key thing for us is to work with the subject matter experts to ask a whole series of questions that start with who, what, why, where, how. Um, so in other words, we're, we are supporting and we're there for the end users because they will be sat in front of an ERP solution about to raise their first sales order and say, where do I choose my customer? Why do I choose that product? Where do I adjust or apply the discount? And it's all of those typical questions that we would ask during the development of those training materials. And it's giving the business context behind why the user does it. So many um, standard training materials um, are literally just functional based. But when I pick something up, if I'm being told to press a series of buttons, especially if we're talking numbers here, I want to know why I'm doing that. So you've got to have that context. And also from a business um, rationale, you want to make sure that your end users, even at field level, are making informed, smart decisions and they're selecting the right values. And um, so that's what you're not going to get off the shelf. That's how we capture that business process information as well. And I suppose one of the other things that I would say is we utilize collateral at the outset and the start of your ERP, ERP engagement because you're going to have objectives, mission statements, um, targets that you want to meet and all of that needs to be encompassed and also packaged up as part of the training program. Your comms messages need to be peppered through the training program as well so the whole thing needs to be joined up and the same messages are being heard by your end user community right from the get-go to the last training session that's delivered or the last piece of self-learning that's completed before you go live. So business process is key. Right. Speaking of business process, how do you, um, where do you recommend that training fits into the sequence of end user training and user acceptance training? Like how, how do you typically see those two best um, interact, those two work streams sort of integrate or intersect? Yeah. That's a really great question, and our clients have different perceptions and takes on it. Um, sometimes they're actually pushed down a certain viewpoint based on where the build is and so on. But ideally, when we come on board, um, we would like to be at the start of the UAT process so they can feed outputs to us. But what we've also been asked by clients to do is develop 60% 
um, of the training programme, develop what is ready, and then the subject matter experts or the super users will take those materials into the UAT uh, mm. window or environment, and they'll actually test them, see proof of concept. Does this work? Is this okay? And they're actually almost testing the training materials um, as they go through UAT. And it's also supporting a lot of those business users that you need to pluck out of the business that have not been exposed to this ERP system. They've not had six months history, you know, with their scrums and their various project meetings and cons. So it's really useful to have those materials available for the UAT audience. Um, we also do offer different flavors of UAT training. It depends who's doing the UAT really. Could be a whistle stop tour, um, because what you don't want to do is um, pull people in from the business when they don't actually know why they're there. So you need to tell them the importance of being a tester, what it's about, how they pass and fail, and how they literally execute test scripts, but also giving them that navigation look and feel of the ERP the system they're going to be testing in. So I suppose that was a very long-winded answer, Eric, to your question. I sincerely apologize, but really, the, I suppose it's all down to the client, where you're at with UAT and how experienced your test user base is going into UAT. And that's how that, how you then decide what training program is required. That's a great, really well said. I think that's a super important point to elaborate on because um, I think too often people think training's over here. Um, you know, Joanne and Nikki are going to handle the training for me. I might handle the mm -hmm. UAT. I'm going to do that over here. And it, there's oftentimes not that intuition that those are two very related work streams and they should reinforce one another. I mean, the UAT can be a great way to to learn the system as you're going through UAT. But to your point too, Nikki, it's a great way to poke holes in and perfect and fine tune the training materials so that you can refine that yeah. and, and make it ready for prime time to roll out to the broader, the, the broader audience. Yeah, absolutely. And when we typically scope um, ERP programs, um, we'll also utilize UAT because we want the client to be spending their training budget in the most efficient and best way that they can. So if you've only got two people managing fixed assets in a shared service center, get them involved in UAT, get them on board early. And there's your on the job training. You don't need to develop a full um, classroom or informal structured session if you've already got them involved at that early stage. Right, right. No, it's really well said. I'd love to hear from the audience too. You know, what, what have you seen work in training uh, deployments in terms of, you know, what have you seen work or fail? You know, what have you seen to be a, a big sticking point in your experience, either a, if you're going through a transformation now, or if you've been through one in the past, I'd love to hear the audience's feedback on what they've seen work or cause failure when it comes to, to training and adoption. So that was our interview with Joanne and Nikki from Optimum and the sister company onboarderp.com talking about how to optimize and to leverage best practices in software training and adoption or employee training and adoption within a digital transformation. So great interview. If you want to see the full interview, go back to episode number 119. You can also click the links below. We've included links to Joanne and Nikki's full interview, which is back in episode number 119. You can listen to the complete interview by clicking the link below or just go to 119 if you want to um, scroll through our past podcast episodes. So that about does it for the show today. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do, if you still are craving to learn more about change management, be sure to check out our guide to organizational change management. It's a guide that uh, has a number of best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. Also provides some methodologies and tips and tricks for how to ensure that you're successful in your change management initiative. So be sure to check that out. Um, you can download that for free or read it for free by clicking on the QR code in front of you. And we also included links to that uh, same report by uh, looking in the show notes for this particular episode. So go, go to the description field below for this particular episode, and you'll see a link to the Guide to Change Management, which you can read for free off of our website. So be sure to check that out for more if you want to keep learning about uh, change management. So I uh, really appreciate all of our guests who have been on the show over the last couple of years talking about change management. appreciate you all for listening. Uh, be sure to check us out every Wednesday, new episodes of Transformation Ground Control. Um, you can find those new episodes on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and it also streams to all the audio podcast platforms throughout the world as well. So be sure to check us out and subscribe to the show, and thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you next week on the next episode of Transformation Ground Control. Take care and have a great week. Transformation.